All right, ready? Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call this Board of Supervisor meeting to order. The date is 8-31, August 31st. The time is 9.01 a.m. You will notice sitting up on the dais to my right is not Jody Hayes. It's Patrice Dietrich, our assistant CEO, who's going to be acting CEO today. I'm going to ask everyone to please stand. I'm going to ask Patrice to lead us in the pledge. And then remain standing for an invocation from Christine Kaufman from the rescue, uh, rescue director with Cross Point Community Church. Please the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. of being here today. I thank you for the people gathered in this room. God, as we pause right now, I just pray for wisdom for the Board of Supervisors. I thank you for their hearts for this community. God, would you give them wisdom, discernment, and, and discussions that they have. Father, would you help them to lean into grace and love. Father, thank you that they are serving their community in this way. So will you grant the wisdom that they need? And for all those in the room, Lord, we just um, we know that when we work together for the good of our community, it, we are blessed. So, Lord, I thank you for each and every person here. And may the Board of Supervisors, God, I just pray that you would help them to find joy and peace in their day. Because I know it's not always easy. And yet they can work together so well. And I thank you for this community that I can be a part of. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Patrice. Thanks, Christine. Okay, we'll move on to item three, which is always a great time. It's something we always enjoy, a presentation for the Employee Service Awards, where we honor 25, and today a 35-year uh, service award. I'm going to start, uh, if you have an agenda, you see that uh, Karen Clark was expected to be here, but she's out on business, so we're gonna push her to another time. I'm going to call Ruben Imperial up, and he can start with the next one. Sorry about that. Good morning. Um, I'd like to call up Mr. Rodriguez, Carlos Rodriguez. Yeah. All right. Um, Mr. Rodriguez uh, started with Behavioral Health and Recovery Services in 1996. As a substance use counselor, that's what, that's what our designations were at that time. And since then, he's become a behavioral health specialist, uh, both in our substance use disorder systems of care and our mental health uh, treatment systems of care as well. Um, he's worked in such programs as our outpatient drug-free program, uh, Turlock Recovery Services, and Modesto Recovery Services, where he continues till today. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez has excelled in his roles uh, on our treatment teams and is known um, as a solid team member and an asset. Uh, Carlos' main duties as a behavioral health specialist is to support our clients with serious mental illness in achieving their mental health treatment and personal wellness goals um, by providing uh, case management, um, uh, crisis intervention, and other rehabilitation services. He specializes in serving clients that are hospitalized by coordinating their care uh, once they are discharged from the hospital and he is also a substance use disorder assessment um, counselor as well and has extensive knowledge um, for our organization working with those that are placed on conservatorship. Um, Carlos, Carlos has, known, has been known and is known as a consistent hard worker and for his positive attitude and approach when serving uh, BHRS clients and working um, with his treatment team. Um, his co-workers um, reported they look forward um, he is in charge of the coffee in the morning so in addition to all the other important work that he does um, Carlos has supported um, it says hundreds but I, I, I'm probably thinking it's more in the thousand area range of individuals overcoming the challenges of mental illness and substance use disorder 
Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, Stanislaus County Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, thank you for your 25 years of services, uh, 25 years of public service um, in our organization. So thank you. Thank you. Can you go to view the place? Thank you much. Well, as I said, the board always loves the opportunity to uh, provide service awards and recognize people. And when I saw you sitting there, I, I said, you know, that gentleman right there is not a 25-year employee. Does he look like he's been with the county for 25 years? He's still got that fresh look to him. <laughs> you know? So, uh, but again, on behalf of the board, uh, we're nothing without our employees. We understand that uh, the ability year in and year out for 25 years in, in, in the job, and I know you've moved through uh, different, different jobs, but truly amazing. And again, we're so appreciative, and, and we hope you have some extra, extra time to give to the county and hope you still love your job. And then we'll also give you a couple of uh, minutes to uh, introduce anyone and, and talk about it, if that's okay. Well, thank you very much, all of you here. Um, I don't know, I wound up here in Modesto because my wife is from Turlock. I'm from the back east, and uh, we met here in school, and I, that's how I ended up here. But anyway, it's been, uh, I don't know, 25 years. Wow. Uh, my two daughters already graduated from college. And um, I remember when I came here, like, there's nothing. This is so flat. There's only orchards and stuff. And back then, it was a lot smaller. I still have the letter from Dr. Poster. Uh, I think it's Larry Poster. Yeah. I still have that letter welcoming me and say, hey, you want to meet? And we met. And back then, it was called mental health, not behavioral health. And there were also like substance abuse counselors we call SACS, and then we changed, like around 2000, we changed to v, uh, VHS. And we went from writing notes to electronic health records, from not having computers to having computers, emails, and so many things, so many changes, and consolidating programs and all that. So through all that, I mean, it was a, an honor to serve this community, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Let's take a Next up is Alyssa Bettis will be presenting for, uh, to Mary Sherwood. Good morning, Chairman Chiesa, um, members of the board, uh, Ms. Diedrich and Mr. Bose. Uh, my name is Elisa Bettis. I'm the Associate Director for the Health Services Agency, and it is my absolute honor to be here today recognizing Mary Sherwood for her 25 years of services to the Health Services Agency. Um, Mary started um, as a community health worker, too, in our WIC program in 1996. Um, she was promoted to a community health worker three in 1998, where she served the nutritional and health and wellness needs of countless families. Um, in 2007, Mary was promoted as a staff services analyst serving in our emergency preparedness department. In 2012, Mary was promoted to an account clerk two in our materials management department where she continues to serve and shine. We all know that if Mary is in need of a goldenrod to be signed, um, and process to be able to meet the needs of our department, oh boy, you better get it to her because she's gonna be making sure that it's there and that our departments have the services and goods and supplies that they need to provide the care that is so needed for our community. Um, I wanted to share a few words um, that Mary's manager and coworkers used to describe her. Um, subject matter expert, hard worker, gets the job done, committed, resourceful, thinks outside the box. Um, I would also like to add dedicated, caring, and patient to the list, especially patient with me when I have a stack of uh, signatures that are needed for her to be able to process her job. Um, during our COVID response this past year and a half, Mary's emergency preparedness experience and skills have been truly invaluable. Mary led our volunteer unit, mobilizing our Medical Reserve Corps of volunteers. She spent countless days, evenings, and weekends recruiting volunteers to serve in such areas as contact tracing, 
COVID testing, and COVID vaccine. The health services agency cannot do this work alone, and we are so thankful for the relationships that Mary built with our Medical Reserve Corps volunteers. She recruited hundreds of volunteers, nurses, EMTs, paramedics, physicians from the community to be able to serve our county, and we are so proud of that work you did. Thank you, Mary. Um, in addition to her volunteer unit work, Mary currently serves in the logistics unit, completing and processing resource requests, or as we have known and learned from Chief Murdoch, um, 213s <laughs> um, in the EOC process, um, and ensures that all of the requests for securing goods and services across the entire emergency operations center happen. Mary gives so much to our organization. She takes extraordinary pride and commitment in all she does. Her remarkable talent in problem solving and her creativity and innovative thinking with new projects puts her in a class of her own. When Mary's not at work, um, she enjoys spending time with her son and daughter. She loves to sew, ride her Harley motorcycle, which I'm a little jealous on, um, and loves her two dogs and one cat. Mary, we are so grateful for all your hard work, dedication, and collaboration for the past 25 years. Your performance and commitment is truly an inspiration for all, including myself. Um, so if we can please join Mary um, and congratulating her for her 25 years of service to Stanislaus County. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> So I can't stop thinking about the Harley. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I'm scared of a moped, <laughs> let alone a Harley. <laughs> that is really neat. So uh, during COVID, and I heard a lot of things about you know the what we've done uh, as an organization, but what you've done personally. Uh, uh, Supervisor Withrow always talks about a servant's heart, and really during COVID, that's what happened. People stepped up uh, to help the community, and. Uh, you're a, a perfect example of that. And again, for 25 years, I, I had a statistic when I gave the state of the county uh, this year. I don't remember what the statistic is. I'm going to look it up. But how many of our employees had been here 10 years or more? And I, it was a high number. And again, you, you listen to Mary's story, and she's promoted up through the ranks and, and stuck with the organization. And again, the, the strength of us, and I'll say that over and over and over again, is the employees of our organization. It's not. It's not the five of us sitting up there. It's not the CEO's office. The strength of the organization is really the people providing services to the, the most needy in our community. So again, on behalf of the board, we appreciate your 25 years of service. Uh, the, the plaque that we give is never, is never enough, uh, but know that in our hearts, we're, we're thinking about how great uh, you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for the 25 years and the opportunities that I've had over these years. I've done a lot of things. I've been a lot of places and I have just enjoyed every minute. This is a great organization and I'm proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Julie Falkenstein is presenting to Maria Nakahara. Thank you. Good morning. I have the privilege, I have had the privilege of working with Maria for most of my county career. Um, she was in the program or in the, the area of public health that I was hired into. Um, she had started working in some other programs as a community health worker two, and then promoted to a community health worker three and started working with pregnant and parenting teens, which is where she has spent the bulk of her time with us. And that takes a particularly special person to be able to reach out and form relationships with teens that often are missing adult figures. Um, 
and Maria is remarkably good at it. And she is a trusted person, and both by the teens and by their families. Um, she was also here during all of COVID <laughs> and was working with us. Um, because of Maria's unique ability with people, I often, when I would get a case that was particularly difficult or where people particularly didn't want to talk to us, I'd give it to Maria. And she never failed to make a connection and gain trust and get the information we needed and provide the family with the services they needed um, in order to weather their COVID infection. Um, it has been an incredible pleasure and very much a privilege working with you. And I appreciate everything that you have taught me over the years. So thank you so much. You're not Harley Ryder? No. <laughs> When I walked up and I saw Mary, I was going to ask what kind of Harley, but then I would have been exposed as a fool. <laughs> what do they say? Better to keep your mouth shut? Yeah, yeah. Um, Maria, again, I, I love when department head levels are talking about a privilege to, to call you a friend and a coworker, and it, it, it shows the respect that is due, again, the employees uh, for your 25 years. And, and I love that uh, you accept the challenge of the most difficult cases, as uh, Julie was talking about, you know, when they have difficult cases and you're, you're the person to go to, you obviously have a connection with people. Again, on behalf of the board, uh, 25 years of service to this community and to the people of the community. Again, uh, this is, uh, and I always feel like we're not doing enough for our employees and, 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 and recognizing, but again, uh, no, on behalf of the five of us, uh, in our hearts, we're very appreciative of your service. Yes, um, it's been a privilege and an honor to work with the community um, in the different places that I've worked during my 25 years, and I'm honored and blessed to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so last up we have, Lisa is going to be presenting again to a 35-year employee, David Sandoval. This is the, uh, this is the platinum standard. That was the gold standard, this is the platinum standard. Oh, yes, yes, I agree. Wow, um, I, I, I actually, had just a hard time putting together words for David. Um, and, and all of our health services agency employees are so committed, so it's an honor to have three here today with long-term service. Um, but David has uh, really grown to be just a, a, a complete um, foundation of our health services agency clinic system. Um, and I am just uh, so happy to be here, David, 35 years um, talking about you. Um, so we are recognizing David Sandoval for 35 years of astounding service to the Health Services Agency. Or as David frequently reminds me, it's really 26 and a half years. 36 and a half. Excuse me, 36 and a half. See, I knew he'd correct me. Um, <laughs> with his part-time work. So um, he often says that I've been working here longer than many of my peers and colleagues have been alive. Um, and that's probably the case. <laughs> Um, David started with the county as a part-time social worker, too, in 1984. At the beginning of 1986, David promoted to a full-time social worker, three, and in 1991, he promoted again to social worker, four. In 2007, David completed the requirements for his licensed clinical social worker certification, and in 2009, he was very deservingly promoted to mental health clinician, too. David has spent the last 20 plus years working as a LCSW or licensed clinical social worker at our Paradise Medical Office location. This clinic serves the very diverse needs of the West Modesto community. This site is also the primary teaching site for our family medicine training program. 
David has trained and molded hundreds of family medicine physicians over this time. He's reinforced caring for the whole person, which includes behavioral and social care, ensuring the best outcomes for our patients. I know we have one of our faculty physicians here today, Dr. James Krauss, and I know he certainly agrees with those sentiments. Throughout David's years of service, in addition to working at our PMO clinic, he has contributed time volunteering for various nonprofits, including serving as a board of directors for the Children's Crisis Center and the Child Abuse Prevention Council. As I reflect on David's legacy, it seems fitting to share a few comments from his colleagues. Committed to serving patient needs at the highest possible level. Very valuable resource. Professional and caring. Resourceful. Builds partnerships within the community to get patients needed services. Um, David will be there all hours of the night, day in, day out, to make sure that his patients have what they need. Coordinates well with doctors and always working towards the best healthcare outcomes possible. He is the first person I call when a patient is in crisis. He is always reachable and will do whatever it takes to help. He helps patients do better for themselves, in turn making the community better. Wow, that one strikes me. Um, for someone to devote 36 and a half years <laughs> <laughs> to serving our patients and his absolute desire is to make sure that he can help them do better for themselves. We could all learn from that, David, and you have certainly helped me become better. Thank you for that. He is a pillar of the PMO community, PMO clinic, and has contributed vastly to the mental and social health of all of Modesto. Certainly has. When David is not working or serving his community, he enjoys the outdoors, spending time hiking, skiing, climbing, biking, anything he can do. He enjoys spending time with his beautiful wife and two boys. Many weekends are spent cheering his boys on in their activities and attending soccer games. I will forever be grateful for David, our whole team will be, as he has contributed to the agency. He is a go-to person who willingly shares his knowledge. After all these years of services, he continues to be dedicated to the agency, the people, patients, and our community. David, it goes without saying that your work is so very important and impactful. Proud to have you on our team, um, and thank you. Um, if we could all join me in recognizing David Sandoval for 35 slash 36 and a half years of service to Stanislaus County. Very nice. I, I, I'm sitting there thinking, I always, you know, you don't have anything prepared. And as I sit and listen, I think about the thousands of lives that have been changed because of you. And uh, just 36 years, I just looked up to, I had the clerk look up, what was the number one song when he started? And it's, it's Prince and Tina Turner, What's Love Got to Do With It? And Prince, When, when Doves Cry. So that's uh, about 1985, right? Is when you start part time. Yeah. I think that's a, that's about it. Uh, truly stunning. Uh, what a magnificent career, and I I can't top what I just heard. And again, you've heard me thank everyone over and over and over again. And the Platinum Standard. I think there's only the, as long as I've been here. I think Patty Hill Thomas was 42 years, and Bertha from the Ag Commissioner was in the, uh, for the low 40s, but. 35 is, is just unbelievable uh, to make a career in one spot and not leave. So you truly, again, have a servant's heart uh, for, the, for the community. Again, on behalf of the board, uh, the, here's a 35-year plaque. Again, not enough. And Miguel Donosa said, we're taking a collection to send you to Hawaii right afterwards. So <laughs> uh, appreciate all you've done. And I'd you. love to turn the mic over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to... Uh, work for the county for you know third, since 1984. I started the old hospital, and um, you know a lot of great, very dedicated employees there, and um, it's been a it's been a wonderful experience uh, transitioning into the clinics and working with the patients that 
that we see. There's a huge need in the community, as I'm sure everybody is aware. And, you know, I've been blessed to be able to work with uh, physicians and co-workers and nurses and, you know, other people that, that we've worked with over the years and seen their dedication and commitment to service as well, which is really important uh, to me. I think that, um, you know, what, there's a couple different quotes that I always think of, I tell my kids all the time, is, you know, is, um, you know just kind of thinking about things is, um, you know, like Mark Twain said, when you tell the truth, you don't have to remember. And, you know, I, I think that that's uh, something to really live by is to just kind of go forth and, and really work hard, uh, take care of the people that you care about, and really to care. I mean, that's really the important thing. And so it's been an honor. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So we're going to take a picture, but i got to ask the 35-year question. How much longer are you sticking around? Um, well... Officially, I retired, but um, we're trying to work on some um, contracting back because there's a need. The retired annuitant, 960 hours. We get six months out of him over and over and over again. I love it. <laughs> All right. I know Karen couldn't make it, but that's 135 years of county experience right there. Truly impressive. Okay, we're going to move on to item two, which is an update from the Turlock Irrigation District regarding the state water board actions. We do have Michael Cook with us, uh, former city manager of Turlock, who's now over at TID taking care of water issues. And uh, this was um, this update came at the request of Supervisor Condit, Chance Condit. And there were some board actions that you know we thought it was important that the public find out about and that we learn about too. So, Michael, it's all yours. Uh, good morning, Chair Chiesa, members of the board. Again, uh, Michael Cook, Turlock Irrigation District. So what happens on August 20th of this year, the State Water Board issued curtailment orders to approximately 4,500 water right holders in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. What does this mean? It means we have to immediately cease diverting flow from the rivers and it applies to pre- and post-1914 water rights holders, so pretty much everybody. So it does not apply to previously stored water, so TID and MID, the water they have in uh, Don Pedro, can still release that to growers for um, irrigation purposes. But what it means is uh, all the water that flows off the mountains right now, so what we call the full natural flow, has to remain in the river and cannot be diverted in Don Pedro for storage or um, irrigation purposes. So um, on September 3rd, we have to provide a uh, compliance certification form and also start providing monthly reports showing our diversions or, or our f flows in the river and also project demand for the next uh, month. Those first reports are due September 10th. And right now, going on right now, is a workshop, uh, online workshop with the State Water Board to help agencies like us uh, comply with the new order. So the stated purpose, the State of California said that climate change induced drought conditions are reducing water levels in the delta to alarming lows. And the curtailment orders are intended to do three things, uh, protect drinking water supplies, prevent salinity intrusion into the delta, and minimize impacts to the fisheries and the environment. So uh, TID's position on this, and again, I'm speaking only for Turlock Irrigation District, but most of our kind of sister agencies are feeling the same way, that Curtailments on the Tuolumne are not needed to meet the stated goals of the broad curtailment order. The local agencies are already managing the system to ensure water supply, uh, drinking water access, and protection of the fishery. And Don Pedro and the Tuolumne is already meeting its minimum required in-stream flows or greater and will continue to do so in the future. So we operate Don Pedro this time of year as a fish-first priority. 
so that we maintain adequate flows as we're required to do in the Tuolumne. And just to give you an example of that, so right now the unimpaired flow in the Tuolumne is about 66 cubic feet per second, which is about 131 acre feet per day, or 30, 43 million gallons a day for my urban brethren. Um, what we're actually releasing into Tuolumne right now is 100 CFS. So we're actually releasing more into the Tuolumne than is running off the mountains because we're required under our license to operate um, from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to maintain a healthy flow in the Tuolumne. So, ironically, the state curtailment order, if we followed it literally, we'd actually put less water in the river than we're putting in right now. So it would have the opposite effect. But again, as we're reg regulated by the federal government, we're actually increasing our flows in the river beyond the full natural flow. So, um, so basically, the curtailment doesn't increase the flow in the Tuolumne. I mean, that's the goal of the state is to increase flows in the river, increase flows in the delta. The curtailment order does not have any effect on the Tuolumne or meet the stated goals for the um, delta because we're already exceeding their goals for the delta. Our main concern is a district. So, and, and just to, to go back, because we can still release water from storage, our growers are still receiving the allotment that was provided to them at the start of the year. So it's not affecting uh, growers in our area at this time. We still have adequate storage in Don Pedro. We can release that in volumes that our growers need. And I think uh, TID's allotment this year is 34 inches instead of the normal 48 inches. So again, this curtailment order is not affecting our growers at this time. But our big concern, our main concern, is that the curtailment order won't be lifted before the winter rains come. So this curtailment order is basically in effect for a year. We're concerned that once it starts raining, uh, which will be then our opportunity to start filling up Don Pedro, getting ready for next year, to, to again build up our, our fish, uh, fish flow requirements, our farming requirements, our, our hydropower requirements, and for MID, our drinking water requirements, that we won't be able to divert those new rainfalls into Don Pedro and start filling up, getting ready for next year's irrigation season. So we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get further and further behind trying to uh, fill up Don Pedro. So again, we're sensitive to the challenges of the, of the current drought, um, but again, we want to make sure whatever the state is doing is um, consistent with the law and the state's, state board's statutory authority. So again, as I mentioned, the big issues is it's not affecting our water supplies this year. Our growers are still getting their deliveries, but it could have a substantial impact if it's not lifted in a timely manner on the water available to our community in 2020 and beyond. Um, so again, we're, we're trying to work with the state on technical issues, like if we project a large storm coming, Will that allow us then to lift the curtailment order to capture that new rainfall into Don Pedro? Um, and again, we also are questioning the state's legal authority and legal justification for the curtailment orders. They did lose a similar case in 2015 when they, they did this before. And so the district's next step is, is to exhaust our administrative remedies, which is called going through a process called petition for reconsideration and possibly um, injunction and likely litigation. Um, so again, in summary, the district's response to the curtailment order is, first of all, compliance. Obviously, we will comply. Um, we're working with uh, the board staff and board members on technical issues, like when will this be lifted, what will be the triggers, um, how can we make sure that we're ready for next year, and then also pursuing all legal remedies. And again, like I said, this, this order is in effect for effectively a year, and the state has not clearly defined what will satisfy their need to lift the order. So that's the big concern for us. What, when will conditions change in the delta? What's the trigger to say, okay, guys, you can start diverting water into Don Pedro and increasing your storage of, of, of water for next year? So again, it's in everybody's best interest to store water as soon as runoff from the Tuolumne Rivershed increases or occurs to allow for water supply for fish, families, farms, and electrical generation. And just kind of in closing, some of the the big picture things maybe for the board and for the public to understand is, you know, climate change is increasing the need for more operational flexibility in our systems. And as we see a variability in, in seasonal snowpack and rainfall, and so sometimes these top-down orders are kind of a blunt instrument that don't allow for the uh, differences in each particular watershed through the state to respond to local conditions. So in that, those cases, water opportunities could be lost. And again, Don Pedro is the engine that drives our local economy, and it relies heavily on a water rights system that's been enshrined for over 100 years now. We are concerned that this may potentially be the first step in a state attack on the water rights system, where they can declare an emergency, all bets are off, and um, 
those with senior rights like TID and MID and others in this region will be struggling to um, operate in the ways they have before. And, you know, the massive investments we've made locally will be um, stranded. And just finally, as you may recall, uh, in 2018, the state updated the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan, and TID and MID continue to negotiate with the state on the idea of a voluntary agreement where we can put um, significantly more flows in the Tuolumne, but maybe not as much as the state prescribes in the Water Quality Control Plan, but um, organizing those flows around an appropriate flow regime, making uh, tens of millions of dollars in investment in habitat improvements and other things that we think together with the flow investment in habitat will actually improve fish conditions on the Tuolumne and the Delta uh, much more effectively than just uh, putting 40 percent unimpaired flow on the river year in, year out. So again, those are my comments on what's happening at the state level. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Michael, on uh, a couple of questions. Where is the level of Don Pedro right now? Are they about 50 percent capacity? Uh, Do you know? Yes. Let me see right here. Where it's uh, our storage is about um, a million acre feet. Yes. Yeah, so we're we're about half capacity. But again, 370,000 acre feet is dead pool, which yeah. you don't go below. So it's less than 50 percent. I think when I I see the Department of Water, I think resources puts out and they show all the reservoirs mm -hmm. and the storage. Don Pedro and Maloney's before they started. The, you know, releasing more water, it looked like they were two of the best in the state. And I have people ask me, but the, the reason is it's managed locally, it's owned locally. Do you have enough water for next year's environmental flows? Yes. Well, what the districts do is actually store water this year for next year so we can meet those environmental flows. So that always comes first. Our fish flows always come first because we have to comply with a license from FERC. What that means, though, is will we have enough water for everybody else? Yeah. And, and that, I guess, when you, when you look at what the stated goal of the um, the water board, either it's saltwater intrusion and or it's fish flows, and you're probably the only reservoir in the state of California that has the fish flows behind the reservoir currently for next year. I think that's always an important statement. It's not trying to uh, shirk your responsibility. It's just the opposite of good operation. And Sigma, uh, we were on a S uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Uh, for all of you, which essentially was passed by the state, and it's it's a pumping a gallon out uh, as you're putting a gallon in through recharge, and that's I'm just trying to make it as simple as possible. But uh, last night in the meeting, we were talking about overdrafting in Stanislaus County, and it's it's pretty major overdraft, especially on the east side, and trying to figure out how we're going to change that over the next 20 years. We have to get. We have 20 years to get into compliance, but it's it's going to be a very difficult process, trying to maintain all of the surface water inside of Stanislaus County and not let anything flow out, especially in the high flow years. And you know, I, I, you don't need to address it. I know I'm making a statement right now, <laughs> but it's it's going to be difficult. And it was it's not a tense meeting, but it's just really trying to figure out how we're going to continue to farm in this county. Um, not just in TID and MID, OID, uh, South San Joaquin, Merced, I think that's, did I forget someone? I think that's it, uh, the tributary authorities. And Don Pedro is the only privately owned reservoir out of New Maloney's part of the federal project and Exchequer or uh, what's the lake called? McClure, right? Mm -hmm. McClure. And so anyways, it's, it's a difficult process. Now the state is treating uh, TID as well as uh, all the same, which may require some action by this board or some thought by this board. So any other questions? Uh, yeah, just a couple quick things. First, Michael, good to see you. Thank you for coming here. Um, and I want to thank Chance for suggesting that we, we do this publicly. You know, we all kind of live this, you know, in kind of this inside baseball. We know what's going on. We're all fighting these fights constantly. But I don't think the public really gets to hear what's really going on and, and the ramifications of what's going on. So I, I appreciate Chance suggesting that we do this and, and getting you here in front of us to talk a little bit about it. You said, um, one of the things you said was uh, the state is going to de declare the state of emergencies and all bets are off. And that kind of seems to be a common thing in the last year and a half that we're dealing with here. Kind of all bets are off, all rights disappear, all uh, you know um, abilities to fight these things kind of seem to go away under the guise of state of emergency. So it's scary. 
the way these things work. And, um, and, and you had said that in the past, 2013, the state had done this once before and they lost in court. So what are they doing different that makes them think that they're not going to lose in court again on this one? Um, not to get too technical, some of the early work they did on their water and availability analysis was different this time to kind of justify why they're going through this curtailment process rather than going straight to cur curtailment. Um, but we still think that analysis was flawed and not to get too boring, but they looked at if we're using water this year like we did in 2019, that was our year, we'd run out at a certain time. But as you know, in 2020 and 2021, TID and MID cut back on its supplies to growers. So we're not using water like we did in 2019, but they use that like as a benchmark here. And so as Supervisor Chiesa mentioned, uh, Don Pedro is in pretty good shape because MID and TID took pro proactive actions to cut back on supplies in 2020 and, 20, and this year too. So it, it's kind of ironic that they pick a year show, hey, you guys are just going to blow through all your supplies in the next few months because this is the volume used in 2019, which was a relatively wet year. Things like that don't make sense. So they've gone through a different process. Um, but again, we'll see what, what happens. Great. And like you said, the other thing that's so ironic is that through this curtailment, they might end up keeping us from being able to store water, which would prevent us from being able to allow these flows to happen. So it just, it's an upside down world right now that we're dealing with and no right. sense to it. But, but thank you for being here. We appreciate um, all the work that you guys are doing and that everybody really is doing is try to fight this fight. So thank you. Uh, just to echo the appreciation of my colleagues, thank you, Mr. Cook, for your presentation today. Uh, thank you to county staff for uh, coordinating with TID and, and having this. Uh, it's very informative and we're with you all the way and whatever you need from our board. I did just have uh, one question uh, regarding uh, the curtailment order. Will this in any way affect SRWA and the agreement between Ceres and Turlock? No, it won't, other than remember the agreement with Ceres, Turlock and Modesto, sorry, Modesto and uh, TID is that the uh, the drinking water plant gets, is on parity with the farmers. So as the farmers get cut back, they get back, cut back 20%, so does the SOWA get cut back 20%. The concern for us is if we can't backfill the reservoir, there's less water available each year, and so the farmers get cut back and the SOWA cuts back, so nobody will be getting their full allotment. Mm -hmm. So that's how it could indirectly affect the SOWA. So no one gets their full allotment, yet the fees and the rates are still maintained the same. So Correct. essentially they're paying for a service you're not fully receiving. Right. And then as Supervisor Chiesa mentioned, then so you, the cities will have to backfill that supply with groundwater. And again, we're trying to get wow. to groundwater sustainability. And the idea is with the SOWA plant, we pump less groundwater and allow <clears throat> the aquifer to recover. Okay. And, I, and I know we've had the Worth Your Fight campaign. We had a big wa uh, water rally uh, led by Assemblyman Gray. Uh, who I was working for at the time in Sacramento, and that's great. And is there any uh, legislative remedies outside of the legal remedies that are currently being proposed or any sort of movement such as that? No, again, we are still focusing on negotiating a voluntary agreement with the Newsom administration to find an alternative to the Bay Delta Plan update, which was the, the 2018 Worth Your Fight um, mm -hmm. campaign. And, the, and so hopefully through negotiation and uh, we can get there without there's no legislative fix at this time. Okay. Well, but that's our, that's our first step is to try and negotiate something. Okay. Well, I guess when you go nuclear, let us know. <laughs> we Thank will. You. Thank you, sir. I guess I'll ask the question directly. Are there still conversations, negotiations on the unimpaired flows, the voluntary settlement? Yes. Agreements? Yep. VAs? We continue to be engaged. Great. Well, that's good to hear. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you very much, Michael, for coming in on sort of short notice and appreciate uh, all you TID and MID and all the irrigation districts do for us. And I always think through the process, I know that large hydro is not considered green energy, but it is the greenest energy. And as we receive less water, there's less generated and it's typically backfilled with gas fired or uh, some, other, some other type. So good for the environment. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to um, item four uh, related to the novel coronavirus. It's an update, and I don't know if we're going to turn it over. No, nope, we're not going to turn it over to Patrice. We're going to turn it straight over to Dr. V. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Chiesa, Supervisors, and Ms. Dietrich, and Mr. Bowes. Um, let me make sure this is on. Nope. All right, um, I, I'm here today to give you an update on, on 
uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So we're going to start as usual with our testing hospitalizations um, data. So as we look here, here is our epi curve that I show each week with the blue being confirmed PCR tests, the green being probable, which are primarily antigen tests. So I, I think you can see we're still mirroring our um, summer peak of last year pretty well. Um, we have some incomplete data. There have been some data system issues again, uh, just almost mirroring last year, uh, with just Kaiser. So uh, I think people noticed that we had a large data report yesterday of 1,000, which is a little bit more than, it's for three days, so that's, that's um, for over the weekend. Um, and that includes some back data from Kaiser, and we should get the final back data from Kaiser today, and many of them from early August. So we have to kind of wait and see what that looks like on our epi curve to be able to um, um, interpret it a little better. But uh, I have a little hope. We did report about 100 less cases last week than the week before, so hopefully we're plateauing and, and can start the down, cur uh, down spot. But it, it just takes a while to be able to make sure where we are and, and see where we're going. Um, here's our daily case rate. We're up to 47.4 per 100,000 per uh, day as a uh, seven-day average and a seven-day leg. Um, and so you can see we uh, didn't quite hit where we were last uh, summer, but again, pretty closely mirroring last summer's um, uh, surge. Our test percent positivity is 12 overall um, and 12.3 in our Healthy Places Index 1, and you can see it decreasing a little bit. Our test volume continues to rise right now with 459.7 per 100,000 people per day. So quite a few tests being done well over a couple thousand per day on average. Um, when we look at our uh, hospitalization and ICU data, um, here uh, you can see our, um, our hospitals are pretty full. We're above last summer's uh, uh, surge peak. Um, I think we had 283 COVID positive in our hospitals as of yesterday um, and 71 in the intensive care unit. So uh, you can see that we uh, have continued to rise. Um, our hospitals continue to be uh, very stretched. Um, this is due to COVID surge. It's due to fires. Um, when, uh, when cities evacuate, like South Lake Tahoe on, on um, Sunday and Monday, then their hospitals have to evacuate. Their skilled nursing facilities have to evacuate. It fills up um, beds in many other surrounding counties and cities and places. and so. We pretty much get asked every day to find beds for people, um, for other hospitals that, that need beds. So it, this is an ongoing thing that will keep our hospitals full for a while. Um, wildfire smoke also will bring more people into the hospitals. So our hospitals are just very busy um, with COVID on top of that. It's really, really being very uh, stretched, um, but they are continuing to manage. I'm going to show you our vaccination data. <laughs> Um, so here we are, if we look at the age group of 12 plus, we, we do have what this says is 50% fully vaccinated and 14.8% positively vaccinated. Again, there's a little bit of a data glitch here. So we are going to see today them finally clean out 18,000 records that we've known that have been in there for at least six weeks that are not, um, they're just basically records that are not true from a clinic that did not happen. So we're going to see this go down by about 1%, but still, um, we're still looking very good here um, for our vaccine data, at least very good, but improving. I mean, we still have a ways to go to try to get to some good immunity in our community. Um, so our doses administered per day, as you can see, we're, we're averaging about 1,300 doses per day. Um, we, we had a little bit of a low around the 4th of July weekend, which, or 4th of July week, which is not surprising. Many people go on vacation then, and it's not a high time to think about going in and getting vaccinated. But we're running here, again, staying pretty even when, and with our vaccination um, each day. So what's new since I was here, and it's, it's been two weeks ago, um, the FDA last week approved Comirnaty. So if you're trying to figure out how that, that name came about, the CO is for a COVID and the mRNA is for the type of uh, vaccine it is, and then they wanted it to sound like community. So they say, so community. Um, this is the Pfizer, the same Pfizer that was under the previous authorization. It is fully approved now with its biologics license for age 16 years and older. It's still under its previous authorization for the 12 to 15 years because they don't have that uh, longer term follow up data. <coughs> and the third dose for people with a weakened immune system. So those are still being used. I did want to say that even though this is under full approval, which usually gives providers more flexibility in use, uh, because this is all free and paid for from the federal government, you all sign a contract, every provider signs a contract with the federal government. 
that they will follow exactly the recommendations of the ACIP. And so um, you have to continue to follow it only as indicated. And any doses that are giving, like people asking for booster doses or people asking for doses under 12, those would be considered vaccine errors. They're, they're not allowed under the federal contract that's signed. So that question gets asked a lot. Um, but currently, those are not allowed under the, under the current system. So for schools, um, as of last Friday, 173 students and staff currently in isolation, um, 3,065 sta students and staff currently in quarantine. We have 326 active quarantines, um, 15 clusters, and five outbreaks in our schools. So a lot of uh, COVID activity, but luckily very little spread. So if you have 173 different introductions, it's, it's good that mostly spread is uh, contained. Um, when we do see spread, it's primarily staff to staff. It's primarily sports, but there is some classroom. Um, if we look, we have our school tab up on our dashboard now, so anyone can go in and view um, um, some school statistics. We have a little bit more there. You can see it by week, um, how many cases are reported, and then you can see by what um, grade or staff, staff versus student, and then by grade. Um, we can't make these um, groups equal in number. I mean, easy to pull out staff, but notice 9 through 12, and the next is pre-K through 4th. So that's actually six years of grade. So just be careful in your interpretation, thinking that they actually have more disease per grade than 5th through 8th, because that's the one that's six years of grades instead of four. So if we pull out pre-K and K, the numbers are, in general, going to be small that we'll have to exclude them from the count. So we've left them grouped in there. So you can visit that. That will be updated weekly um, on, our, on our dashboard. Um, this uh, report came out last Friday from Marin. Uh, we heard about it in the public health world as it was ongoing. So they had an outbreak with Delta variant last spring in an elementary school. And I think there's some important things to look at here. So there was a teacher who um, became symptomatic and worked two days while symptomatic and took off uh, the mask occasionally when speaking. It's, it, you know, it's an elementary school's class and enunciation and speaking and reading. So what you can see here is um, uh, half the kids in the class became infected. Um, every single person in the front row, and you can see as you move back, there was less infection um, with distance. So I thought this was important for a couple of things. The mitigation that we have in place, which is stay home when you're sick, keep your mask on, really are very important. Um, there were six feet between all these desks, um, left to right and front to back. Um, and yet you can still see that transmission does occur, but still you can see it's more in the front than the back. So never forget that distance still is important um, as you're doing this, as is masking and, and staying home when you're sick. So when we look at this one case, there's the teacher, all the initial cases, they took it home and spread it to siblings, which are the lighter blue. They spent it to their parents, which are the striped ones. Um, there was another small outbreak in another class in the same school, and they weren't seeing much in school, so this was pretty unusual. They think somehow they were related, but couldn't actually make them be related. But you can see there's the one big large dots, um, dashes for the teacher, and then the small dotted line. Um, that second class had a sleepover, and that case came um, seemed to come after the sleepover, so it looked like it was probably an extracurricular activity was spread. But... Again, just bringing this to highlight our um, mitigation measures in schools that really do work um, if they're kept in place. I wanted to go through a little bit again of the uh, school guidance that uh, the California Department of Public Health has put out that we work under. So, and to review this because there seems to be some confusion, especially around um, modified quarantine. So we have to remember that the state's objective is in-person learning for all. And there are two goals that they stayed in there is to get all kids learning in person and to keep them there. And so I presented these slides in July, so I brought them back because we're getting a lot of calls on this. So the modified quarantine, just a quick run through that, it's if for people who are unvaccinated, if both are masked, um, the exposed can stay in school and not have to go home for quarantine with a testing strategy, but it's only in the classroom. So they may not participate in extracurricular activities. And that's where a lot of the confusion is coming in about the guidance. Vaccinated, of course, don't have to quarantine. Unvaccinated and unmasked do have to quarantine at home for those 10 days. Um, so there is school exclusion. But this is um, the modified quarantine is kind of modeled after the essential workers. So law enforcement, healthcare workers, they're, they're quarantined, but they're allowed to go to work because if in staffing shortages, because we can't be closing hospitals if our healthcare workers are out. So, 
it's the same trying to get kids learning and getting their education in school. Uh, so for antigen testing, so that modified quarantine has this testing strategy, which many of our schools are using the antigen testing at school. Um, however, there's now a nationwide shortage of the antigen testing. There's no shortage of issues. Um, so it includes both the ones for healthcare use, which uh, our schools are using. They're under a CLIA license for wave tests, and also those that are over the counter. Um, so uh, as we go over and look at what we have to do now, um, we, uh, until they can find an alternate and um, we can get some uh, manufacturing going again and get a, a stock of antigen tests going, um, we're having some difficulty obtaining um, Binax now for the on-school uh, testing program. But we have some supply in our warehouse and we've supplied the schools for at least the next month and we'll probably have one more month to keep them going. And then hopefully we will have some sort of supply in place after that. But just letting you know that the, these antigen tests are now um, getting to be unavailable and um, PCR will be the only test we really have. Um, so we can still have our testing sites. Um, they still have availability. The turnaround time still stays good. According to our dashboard, it's still about one and a half days. So we have good uh, testing turnaround um, through our site. So um, you can visit our website um, and make an appointment and go get tested. Um, booster doses. Uh, so these are for people who developed immunity that waned over time. This is different than the third dose. Um, so there's been a lot, a lot in the news about booster doses and uh, the federal government announced that there were going to be booster doses starting September 20, which was kind of a surprise to all of us in public health. Um, we have not yet seen the data to support a recommendation for the entire population. Um, we've seen some data that um, may be certain subsets, but not for everyone. Um, we still have seen excellent, excellent protection against hospitalization and death, probably around 94, 95%. Um, still good protection against infection, um, not as high, but still very good. Um, there may be certain subgroups, such as people who are greater than 75 years or those in congregate living. So I'll show you the two little pieces of data that we have. Um, so this is looking at hospitalization among uh, vaccinated people and looking at the vaccine effectiveness. And that red line you can see is for those 75 and older. And you can see it decreased a little, still above 80%, but it has decreased a bit over time. Or with Delta, it's, it's hard to really tease out if it's time or Delta is the problem. But you can see for 18 through 49, 50 through 64, and 65 to 74, there's still excellent, excellent protection against hospitalization. That has not decreased. So uh, I think there is a case to be made for um, people who are 75 and older. Then as we look at these data, which are from um, long-term care facilities, they looked at infection. So th they didn't show an increase in hospitalization, but they did look at infection. And we know that uh, you know, bringing infection and having infection in long-term care facilities has had deadly consequences. So it is important in our congregate living here. And you can see that overall um, with Delta, but that's oft, uh, uh, also over time, you can see both with Pfizer and Moderna um, decreased protection for people who are uh, pretty you know, exposed often um, down to 50% for infection. But again, reiterating that they found no increase in hospitalizations or decrease in protection in this particular study. So these are both from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice meetings. I put the link at the bottom. They met yesterday to discuss this. So these are fresh from yesterday's meeting. Um, so I think we're, we, we're still waiting to see what goes on. Um, I think we've all heard of the data from Israel, but um, if you stratify their data by age, they still have very good vaccine protection. So we're uh, waiting to see what uh, the FDA has to say when they look at the data, um, what um, the advisory committee has to say um, as we move forward. But, we're looking and putting together a plan um, to vaccinate uh, if this is approved by the FDA for a booster dose and if it is recommended by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice. They're the ones with the physicians or ex vaccine experts from all over the United States that meet to make recommendations on vaccination. So when we look at our capacity, um, overall we have about 20% probably the capacity that we, have, that we had um, last winter. Um, healthcare systems, of course, don't have the capacity right now in the middle of surge. 
public health also does not have the capacity. Pharmacies gearing up for flu season, um, they can administer both at the same time, but it will be difficult for them to take on COVID and flu and, and keep this going. So we have about 20% of the capacity, so we're making a, a plan of how we can um, administer these boosters if they become recommended. And so again, here's where you can go to schedule a vaccine through my turn. Um, and you can either call, you can call my turn, you can go online or you can call the public health and get scheduled to get your vaccine. Um, or you can go on our website where we have links to all the pharmacies that are carrying vaccines as well to schedule through their systems. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. V. So yesterday I was driving in Turlock I went by to check out the testing facility they have on uh, CSU Stands campus, and I counted 75 cars, and I stopped counting at 75 cars, and they were almost all the way out to Monta Vista Road. I'd never seen anything like it, two lanes. And so ha we must have seen a meteoric rise in testing. Is it because of requirements in certain areas, or is this just the population in general stepping up? I think it's, it's, I think it's all of the above, yeah. So we were just under 200 per 100,000 tests per day, so we've more than doubled our tests per day. But yeah, there's a lot of requirements for testing or vaccination that are that are increasing testing. Schools are in, which is increasing testing. And then there's, of course, more people being infected and more exposures with testing. So yeah, testing is, demand is really increased. But um, luckily, we've been able to meet it. That side is run by HR Support, which is well, one of the contractors that, that runs testing. Okay. And I saw a uh, Riverbank City Councilman who has a underlying condition got a booster shot already, and we're talking about booster shots since September. And I noticed you were seemed like you were a little tepid on how we would do that. And I guess if if we made it available to 75 and over, and you know we started doing the same thing we did last time, do we have the ability, the internal? I mean, because we've stepped down everything, and we've really turned it over to the local health providers generally we still have a site ourselves but uh, would this be rebuilding the whole machine is there enough people that want it have you talked to anyone um those so are a lot of questions i think i know i think there is people will, it depends on how it's recommended um you know people will, if it's just like a permissive recommendation oh you can have it which isn't allowed right now i mean it's not um people can do it but it's not um so I think it makes a difference how strong the recommendation is, what the demand will be. Um, our biggest uh, planning need, I think, is our long-term care facilities, our congregate living, because the Federal Pharmacy Partnership with Rite Aid and CVS went into those, and I think Walgreens too, went into those um, facilities and vaccinated, and they will not be doing that. So we, they went into over 200 facilities in our county and vaccinated, and trying to stand up teams to go into facilities and vaccinate is going to be very difficult, so yeah. Facilities like we used, you know, um, many facilities because they weren't being used last winter. So we had empty facilities that were happy to be used. So the facilities are now in use, so they're not available. Um, staffing has gone back to their regular jobs, so they're less available. So there's just many things that are making this much harder to ramp up. But we can do it at certainly 20% of the capacity. Um, it just has to be people are going to be patient. Pharmacies will will ramp up. Healthcare systems will ramp up. So. Um, and it's only one dose, so that helps, but it's going to be difficult to mobilize uh, quickly. You know, I mean, if, if, if a lot of people want it at once, it's, it's going to be hard to be able to meet that need. Yeah, and that's 20 days to, or, you know, yeah. uh, three weeks away. So, yeah. okay, we'll have to continue that conversation. Other questions? Dr. V, thank you so much for your presentation. As usual, wonderful job. Uh, would you say that the upswing in uh, vaccination is kind of being driven by the FDA approval for the Pfizer? You know, you hear that some places, but I, I don't know. I, okay. I can't tell. I what, would you have a estimation on when the Moderna and the J&J &J would be FDA approved? Uh, you know, I haven't been following it. Um, I thought Moderna, they were only a week behind for okay. the first one, but I think they're quite a bit behind. So they said, they said when you, for a full biologics license, which is they, what they had, they had to review 340,000 pieces <laughs> documents pieces of paper and you know they have to visit the facilities they review each person in the study where they have over 40,000 for each one it's a huge massive load that takes them I think they said 97 days so I'm gonna guess it's gonna take a while just because it's it's so intense okay and then I, I know you mentioned uh, the hospitalizations and the rise and the how we're stretched thin 
Uh, do you have a specific breakdown on what hospitalizations are COVID related and not COVID related? So, um, you mean for all the people who test positive? Uh, essentially, yeah. Those that are hospitalized due to COVID versus those who are just there because of other issues. Yeah, so, and they, they test positive, but they went in for, you know, I don't know, surgery or something like that. We are yeah. not able to break those down. Unfortunately, nobody has been able to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. This is a presentation by Dr. V. No comments, please. All right. Um, did you get all your questions answered? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. V. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. V. Very informative. It gives us a good opportunity to go back to people that ask us questions uh, regarding some of the data. One thing that came up yesterday, a uh, um, constituent sent me a little snapshot of our website. There was no data updated due to the changes states vaccine database. Uh, I had a message as soon as it logged in. This was ah. around 5 o'clock yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody that must check it on a daily basis, but it was brought to my attention, so I said, we'll be getting an update today, so I thought it'd be a good time to see and I can answer back. But then they did some of their own research, and it said something like the provider's report that the state does, it's something that the county doesn't do, and that's why there was a lapse in that data, because that's directly given to us by the state. So the data that we use to populate the vaccine dashboard um, comes from the state because not everyone it, um, uh, puts the, the, the data in the same system. So they take all the systems and put it in one database. We have only updated that dashboard once a week. And so yesterday I asked that they put a notice on there, I actually meant in the text, but to, to say that we only update it once a week because the cases and everything else is, is daily. The schools is only gonna be once a week as well. So um, it always was only once a week. Uh, the notice just went up. Okay. So that, that's data for the schools that's accumulated throughout <clears throat> the state that's put on our dashboard. That's Not cumulated for, for our county from our database. I mean, there'll be a, yeah, it's from our county. Okay. some notes if I have anything follow up I'll answer or ask you um, okay. in regards to this but thank you so okay. much again thank for the presentation you. supervisor Withrow. okay great Julie thank you again for all you're doing I know this is still continues to be a nightmare and um, but we appreciate all your efforts just a couple things just to keep things in perspective that we always you know we talk about the kids and the, the 173 kids and the, we get a lot of this out of the newspaper too where these you know, but to put that in perspective, I think we have a little, little over 100,000 kids, K through 12, in our schools. So we're talking 0.17 of 1% of our kids have, you know, contract contact this this virus since school started again. So just, you know, when we it's, it's always easy to we just throw the number out there, but let's really keep things in perspective as far as the kids and the infection rate. So that's one thing. Um, and I know that you're just, you've got so many numbers you're throwing out there, so you could, you could be here all day long if you wanted to, to try to do that. So I don't you know, expect you to do that. But as the accountant, I'm gonna do that, just to, to make things perspective, keep them in perspective. The other thing is, I just wonder, do we have a plan um, in place, um, whether it's for the county or for the hospital, as this train continues to come down the track of um, the mandate for healthcare workers to be vaccinated by September 30th, and if nobody blinks in that as they approach each other, and we have a serious reduction in workforce in our, in our healthcare workers, um, what's, our, what's the county's plan? Because I know we have the same mandate that we're having to deal with here. What are we gonna do if all of a sudden we have a serious reduction in, in healthcare workers um, come September 3rd? Have we started to think about that? Have we, have we, are we just assuming that oh, it's gonna work out? So really, we meet with our hospitals probably twice a week, and our hospitals are planning, and we are working to support them in their plan. That, that is, yes. So do you have any idea what that plan is? What they're, have they decided that they had a reduction in five, ten percent of their workforce, how they're gonna handle it? They're, they're still working on the plan, yes. I guess. Okay, okay, I'm just, I'm just hoping that somebody, like I said, is planning for this, if this is what ends up happening, so. Okay, thanks, Julie. All right, no more questions. Thank you very much, you. Dr. V. Appreciate it. You know, we're gonna move on to item five, which is a public comment period. It's an opportunity to speak on anything that is not on today's posted agenda. 
and I have uh, uh, you guys will be able to comment uh, up here when you come during public comment not to sit and question Dr. V. So uh, it's an opportunity to speak on anything that's not on today's posted agenda. Five minutes, please limit your comments to five minutes. You can fill out a speaker card, you don't have to, but it just makes for expediency. Um, I will call, uh, I've got about five speaker cards, so uh, the first one is Miguel Donoso. It'll be followed by Stephen Morrow. Good Thank morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I don't know if you guys remember or not, but the September is the heritage of the Hispanic community. I don't know if you want to put it in the agenda for the next meeting or not, but just telling you just in case you forgot. Okay. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, we have an executive order 13995 regard to the COVID-19, and you're going to have two issues to speak in regard to the COVID-19. And millions and millions of dollars are going to speak this morning. But Mr. Chairman, in these two reports, you never mentioned of the Mexican and Mexican American and Latinos for 2020, 73% or more was affected of the COVID-19. It looked like, well, it's not here, Mr. Hayes, forgot some time that we exist in this community. And you, the same as the board, look like we are not here. You never mentioned back. And you're talking about millions of dollars. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, I feel very strongly that in that time, from May to September, October, the Mexican and Mexican American Latino community was the hardest hit by the, the COVID 19. In the same time, in the health, mental health, jobs, businesses, owning of homes, renting, and sometimes homeless, and people that die in that time. And yet you still keep it like, we're not here. So it looks like we're invisible. And the CEO is still not notice or no one to mention in whatever report is, never. So it looks like, to be honest with you, we are being discriminated openly. And I feel very strongly if you are discriminated, it means that this board is very racist board. Very racist board and very racist board. And this thing that you come out and play to the fly, just a fraud, I don't think so. And this thing that we come and ask for God to be nice and respect and like every, I don't think so. Somewhere, somehow, this board continue to be racist to us. And we want to see that pretty soon and ask for any agency, the state and federal funds to come out and ask him why you are so racist. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Steve Morrow, followed by Michael Leonard. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman and board members, I first want to thank the Stanislaus County Regional Transit Authority for waiving bus fares this quarter. So my fellow bus riders and I very much appreciate this. At the August 10th meeting, I made reference to home affordability while commenting on the Stanislaus 2030 Economic Develop Development Initiative. Now this initiative, while intended to help the long-term economic health of the county, could also have a big impact on home affordability as well. So I collected some data on income and home prices to illustrate what a typical family looking to finance a home is going through. Now the median sale price for a Stanislaus County home in June 2021 was $426,500. Now the 2019 median annual household income in the county was $63,037 or approximately $52.53 per month. Now, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I worked for a savings and loan company and the vice president for loan administration was commenting on parameters he used for loan approval. Now one key point was that the principal and interest payment 
should not exceed 28 percent of household income, although we did consider other factors. So in this example I'm using today, that median family should be able to afford a payment of around $1,470 per month, principal and interest. Now with the current interest rate, last week was about 3.27 percent for a home mortgage. So that means that if you put the payment and the interest together, that's about a $336,000 mortgage that the family would be able to support. So this median family would be able to buy that, that median home, but they'd have to come up with $89,000 for a down payment. Now, I can't speak for everybody in this chamber. I know I'm a little bit short of having that. So that is a big issue we have to look at. Now, other programs are available through federal and state agencies as well as private sources that can help bridge that gap toward making down payment and, and affording the mortgage. And as always, keeping a good credit score can slice off 25 to 50 basis points off your interest rate. Now, if a family can't afford that median home, that doesn't mean they're out of luck. Before we got married, my wife and I went house hunting and we found a real nice home in Patterson that had a lot of features we were looking for. Unfortunately, we just couldn't pencil out the numbers and we had to pass on that home. So we kept looking, found a nice home in Keys, there were some incentives involved, and we purchased the home. 25 years later, we still live there. Now, the best way to increase household income is to help people get their own businesses started and provide support for them during those tough early years. This is where the Stanislaus 2030 program could be a big help toward helping families, whether they own the business or are employees of these businesses, increase their household incomes. And that can make home ownership not a dream but a reality. Final point, the 25 years ago, the price for that house in Patterson was $108,000. How times have changed. Mr. Chairman and Supervisors, thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Uh, very good. And I wanted to point out the LC Top, which is Low Carbon Transit Operation Programs. They fund those free rides and all the transit operators, of which there's now only two in the county, uh, the, uh, Modesto and Stanislaus County merged. And then there's also Turlock, but that's where we're putting the LC Top money to encourage free rides on transit. So thank you for those comments. And we do have a housing crisis for sure. Michael Leonard is up next followed by Lisa Trotson. Thank you, gentlemen, for hearing me. Um, I have a, actually a couple questions. Did you know uh, the local code enforcement uses ordinances uh, to single out individuals and choose who they will and will not require or enforcement from? And they, they use them to harass individual people. My second question is, uh, did you also know that um, for full and active permits for housing, um, code enforcement will still continue to follow, dictate workflow, and work to be completed. Let me give you a background of this, and I've been here before. Um, December 3rd, I got a call at 1 a.m. One of my houses had burnt down. It was in the active process of being burnt down. Uh, fire department, I arrived. Three different sections of fires, uh, three different places that uh, firemen were standing there with hoses and only one hose was putting the fire out, two of them just sitting there. I asked one of the firemen, is it standard practice to allow fire, a house to burn down in the ghetto areas where I own and manage rental properties? And they said, no, we just don't have access. Yet two hoses are sitting there, easily accessible to shoot water onto my house and they let it burn. Now, ultimately, how does that uh, relate to code enforcement? Um, we were later to find out, how did this fire start? It started from an Ill illegal marijuana grow two doors over that followed the fences down and then caught my house on fire. Nothing associated with us, no criminal activity associated with my house. So two weeks later, what happens? We're still reeling from figuring out what we're gonna do, helping the tenants find a new home, trying to get their few valuables that were left after the fire department didn't put the fire out, just let it burn to the ground. And code enforcement sends me three different notices because the three adjacent houses are all belong to me of trash in the yard. Of course there's trash in the yard. The place just burned down. Before code enforcement even had opportunity to come out and inspect, we'd removed a large amount of the debris from the fencing and, and there was just a few things left at, from the fire itself. They opened active code enforcement complaints against me. 
because of this. No code enforcement complaints were filed against the marijuana grow, which is actively an illegal grow in the, the airport district. Uh, code enforcement continues to follow me through different projects like this. I have I pulled active permits on the, to, demolish, to demolish the house that was burnt to the ground. They will not close the complaint. They require me to meet them two, every two to four weeks. They say they will not give me extensions, even though I'm fully legal. I'm conducting full business. I'm not doing anything abnormal here. And yet every two to four weeks, I'm required to meet with them and uh, to show them active uh, progress. As a matter of fact, yesterday I was on the phone with one of the code enforcement agents and I explained to her we've been working on the actual house because it was a nuisance and it's almost all the way gone. We've got about two more trailer loads of debris to haul out. Um, and the code, I, I told her that we hadn't done anything with the other property that only had just a pile of wood that they wouldn't approve because that there was no, there was too much trash in the yard as they deemed what they called trash yet. It was plywood that's now $60 a sheet, but they didn't like that it was in that property. Um, she then said, well, as long as you're making active progress on the burnt house, I, I can, we'll be able to extend an extension for that. But the house that you're not making progress on, we're not going to be able to make an extension on that. And so they're dictating how I get the work done, what my yards look like. Now, ultimately, I don't want to be out of compliance in any code enforcement areas. I want to follow every county ordinance, and I want my houses to be maintained. I work with downtown streets. I work with Section 8. We try to get people off the street into housing. These aren't, the, these aren't the neighbors you would want. That's just the reality of it. They're a little messier than most. They usually have more cars than most. And they're, not, they're truly not the neighbors you want. But they're also in the airport district. They're not in the areas you would probably normally live. Where they single me out, one of the neighbors directly across the street from my burnt house, there are trails to his front door, literal trails. Complaints have been filed multiple years ago. And to this day, nothing has been done. Now, the uh, property three or four doors away, they have an active uh, mobile home, or trailer in the backyard. Not permitted. It's a 20-foot travel trailer that they allow people to live in occasionally. Active code enforcement complaints on that. And code enforcement does nothing. They individually, when somebody was willing to do something, they will enforce it. But if they choose not to, they don't enforce it. I've been here before. I've talked with you gentlemen before. And you guys sent me to the director of, of code enforcement. It was one evening that I was here. Go ahead and, and finish your thought. And the code enforcement director was literally drunk. Her makeup was smeared across her face. Nothing was done with this. And I don't know where to go. Where do you move forward with this? OK. So I have your number. And uh, uh, Supervisor Graywall represents the airport district. And so we'll get together, maybe me and him, and, and talk about this. I appreciate it. Thank okay. you. OK. Thank you, Michael. Next up, uh, Lisa, followed by Don Reese. Hi there. Hi. Good morning. Hi. My name is Lisa Trodson. I'm a little nervous. It's out of my comfort zone, but <clears throat> I felt like I had to speak. I'm not here to discuss COVID-19 and all that it entails because it's way beyond what I can speak to and much too complex to get into over this limited time that I have here today. So I want to thank you in advance for listening and I'll try not to get too emo emotional, but no promises. What I am here to say is I was born with my God-given rights to make an informed decision on behalf of my own health and body circumstances. It isn't the government's business what my medical records of the past say, nor what my current health status is or isn't. Let me be crystal clear. I am not anti-vax. I've been vaccinated throughout my childhood, and I have taken the flu shot for the past 12 years for my job. I am not refusing this vaccine, but the bottom line for me is I want my choice, like everyone else gets. I have been in healthcare for the last 27 years, and I have been in this community for over 30. No, I'm not a nurse, and I'm not a doctor. But what I am is a human being. I started in a few other positions here at the hospital at Memorial. 
I'm currently a staffing coordinator and I'm responsible for six departments and surgical services that equal 150 employees. I have a big responsibility. <clears throat> Sorry. I do all their scheduling and their time cards by myself. Was I a little scared in the beginning of the pandemic? I'd be lying if I said I wasn't. I'm not, I don't touch patients. Okay, I'm in the back end. I have my own office. I've been at the hospital in the, basically in the front lines of 526 days. I've never been sick. I've never been tested. I have a great immune system. I have walked up and down the stairs, the halls, both sides of the hospital. I've been there for 14 years. I work extremely hard at my job. And now I'm forced with a choice of I either take a shot or I lose my job. No one should be for threatened, forced, or cursed into making that choice. All I am asking for is the respect that is given to others to make a sound decision to get this vaccine or not put something into my body that I have no idea what it's gonna do to me now, six months from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, or the effect it's gonna put on my family. Please help us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up is Don Reese. And Michael, if I could tell you also, Patrick Cavanaugh, raise your hand, Patrick. We're going to start with him. He's, he's uh, an acting director right now. Okay, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Dawn Reese, and I'm um, here because I am concerned. Um, Mr. Whitthrow, you hit the nail on the head. Our world is topsy-turvy. The reality is we don't know what we're doing with many, many things for our health. Um, yesterday, uh, Mr. Condon, I sent you a video, and I don't know if you watched the video, and I don't even know if it was okay if I sent it, but you are on my Facebook page, probably because you wanted us to vote for you, and we did, um, just as everybody's been voted for here. Um, my concern is that I, I have been vaccinated, and um, uh, we, uh, as I said the last time I was here, we are not anti-vaccine. We are anti-vaccine that has not been proven. Even the FDA says in their approval that there are risks and there, are, there can be damage. Our kids, I'm here today mainly because of my grandchildren. I want them to go to school, but if the state mandates that our children have to be vaccinated, they're not going to go to school. We're not going to put a poison in our children's body when in Japan, 1.6 million vials had debris in them, metals, all kinds of things in them. And they are being pulled off. And that's Moderna. That's the one that I have in me. So if people want to get the vaccine, knock yourself out and get the vaccine. But if you don't want the vaccine, why should we be forced to get the vaccine? The other issue that I'd like to speak about is the AB 455. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, it was pulled off, just so you know. They, they... Thank God. Answer the prayer. So for now, but if it isn't pulled off or if it comes back or if the state mandates that our children have to have vaccines, I ask you as a board, where do you stand? Where do you stand with the families that have young children that we do not know in the future what's going to be for them? I'm old. My life is over. If, you know, if the vaccine kills me, it does. If COVID kills me, it does. I know where I'm going. Christ has a place for me in heaven. But doggone it. We need to take a stand and stand up for our children who are defenseless. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Okay, anyone else for public comment? Come on forward if you want to speak. Hello, my name is Wanda O'Mara, and I'm a health care worker. And first of all, I want to thank you for listening and, um, and being here today and some of my cohorts being here today. Um, first of all, I want to let you know, I'm a monitor tech. I watch heart rhythms, and I've been doing that for 15 years in healthcare. And I had a very wise cardiologist say to me, 
You know, everybody's heart is very much like their thumbprint, very unique. So with that being said, health care should always be a choice. It is unique. I am not anti-vaccine. I've taken a flu shot for 20 years. But I have comorbidities that would cause me to be at risk of that vaccine. So I choose not to vaccinate at this time. I've spoken to, to two of my medical doctors who have advised me since I had COVID last August that I have T cells and memory cells that will help my immune system. My question here is the push for vaccine, why aren't we pushing for healthy immunity? Can we just try that? I've seen the numbers. I've seen the numbers that the doctor presented. I also see the numbers every day and have seen it for 18 months. I'm telling you, COVID is curable. And we have to remember that before we force people to take this vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. I said thank you, Wanda. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi. Welcome back. My name is Corinne Whitlow. You guys are very well. Um, you guys know me by now. Okay, so basically at first I, have, I wanted to say, um, Dr. V mentioned with the booster shots coming, we might not have what we need to get those booster shots out to the community at this point, but I want to let you know there's plenty of people in your community who want to help your community, so we are available for these type of processes. Um, we are not anti-vaccine, we just want what's appropriate for our community. Um, I am just happy to be here and using my First Amendment rights. I'm very concerned about our amendments and our Constitution losing its value. So just being here and being able to utilize that, I feel like is a privilege, so thank you. Um, I was here previously fighting for my livelihood, and now I believe I am here fighting for California's livelihood and the American dream. Um, there, we heard that the state doesn't have a plan for what happens when we feel the repercussions of this order. They are depending on our hospitals, which we are currently short-staffed and been trying to get travelers for months. So our hospital plans are out there. Unfortunately, there is nobody on the other side of those plans. And as we um, have been told today, the state doesn't have a plan for us. So here we are um, back to square one, essentially. Um, we have this thing in nursing where we don't just look at the numbers, we don't just look at labs, we look at the patient, right? What does the patient look like? So we can look at COVID numbers, we can look at vaccine statistics, we could do all that stuff, but we need to look around at our community and our state and our country. What, is, what does that look like? Um, in my opinion, it doesn't look good. It looks very mishandled, and I believe that's coming from our failed leadership, which is quickly picking up momentum. I don't believe we can slow this down. I believe our only hope is to stop it. Um, these mandates and these orders go against our foundation of the Constitution and everything that our country has fought for. We've worked too hard to allow our state and our country to go in this direction, and we are not going to allow it. Um, we are working against this momentum, and I do believe that we need to um, come up with, a, with an offensive move. We're, Things are coming at us so quickly, we're constantly in defense mode, um, fighting for our lives and our livelihood, but we're at that point where we got to switch over. We have the AB 455 possibly came off the table for now, but we're looking at AB 1102, and I'm sure after this meeting there'll be one coming out tonight that we'll be fighting. They're just going to continue to keep us on the defense so they can try to break us down, um, but we're just not going to allow that. I was looking at some statistics on the amount of people who left California from 2010 to 2020. Um, over 6 million people left California with only 4.9 people coming into California. So that's a pretty big decrease in our population here in California. And actually in 2020 was the first time our population overall decreased. decreased. People are leaving California because of this leadership. Um, I have no doubt it is coming from the top. And so we are working hard to get rid of that and recall him. Um, so I pretty much... I mean, like I said, we can look at statistics, we can look at numbers, but we need to look at our state. We know we need help. We're here to help. I know you guys are here to help. Um, I'm not here to preach for the choir. I'm more here to talk on the record, I believe, and show you that your community is here for you, and we're here for California, and we're not going away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else for public comment? Anyone else that wants to speak during public comment, get in line or I'm going to... Hello. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. 
Okay, I think you know where I stand. I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 10 years in this community. I've treated COVID patients. Can I get some your name? I'm sorry. Rebecca, sorry. Oh, Rebecca, okay. Rebecca. Some lived, some died. I've done CPR on patients that did not turn out very well. There was no six feet of distance required for me to stay six feet apart, right? I didn't have that luxury. So when she was talking about six feet of distance, I, I find that funny. Um, I know that you know where I stand. I'm anti-vaccine for this because it hasn't been around long enough. We do know that there's still breakthrough cases. I would love to hear their response to why there are breakthrough people that are still dying after they've been vaccinated and they're dying from COVID. You ask some very great questions. Are they being hospitalized because of COVID or it's just randomly we happen to find out that they have COVID once they're there? Those are very good questions to ask and that's why the numbers may look worse than they really are. And they're, allowed, they're fine with that. They're fine with exaggerations and lies. And I told you last time, they're lying to you. And I'm going to tell you again, they're still lying to you. Nothing has changed. So that being said, you know where I stand on vaccination regarding this. I want to ask you guys, do you know what it is to be a nurse? Do you know what my scope of practice is? Do you know what I'm supposed to be doing? Before I give medications to a patient, that the doctor says this patient should get this, this, and this, and this is how you're going to do it. Do you know that I'm supposed to check certain rights? Is this the right patient? Is this the right route? Is this the right dose? Is this the right reason? And to use your name, the buck stops with me. That doctor's not running around injecting people or handing out pills. That's my job. I'm the safety net to protect you and your children and your families from making sure the doctor knows what he's doing or she's doing. I'm that security catch when they mess up. I'm there to say this is wrong, this is inappropriate. And I have had doctors come to me and say, don't let my patients suffer. Let me know what you think they need. I will sign that order. We have a good relationship with doctors. They're supposed to trust us and we trust them. But what I'm seeing today are so many reasons to start not trusting some of these doctors. Doctors that don't have privileges to walk through the hospitals. Doctors that have never stepped room in a COVID patient. They're not researching therapy to help these patients. They're wanting to give a radical treatment in case something happens. Let me tell you something. Ovarian cancer kills millions of women. There's no test for it. So do we run around doing radical hysterectomies on people just because they may end up with this someday? No, we don't do that. That's radical. That's excessive. That's ridiculous. If a patient came to me and said they want star chemotherapy just in case they have it, I would have to advocate for that patient and tell them the risks. If a doctor were to start doing radical treatment like that, I have to speak for that patient and say they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're agreeing to. That's informed consent. So let me ask you a question. Do you know what happened in 1999? The Gallup poll was invented and they asked all Americans, what is the most ethical, ethical profession? And do you know who has been winning every year since 1999? Nursing. We are the most ethical profession. We will tell you the truth whether you like to hear it or not. When someone else is lying to you, that's our job to come and tell you the truth and to stop harm from coming to you. And we don't care what language you speak or what color you are, what nationality you are. We don't care what you look like. That's our job to be ethical and to be honest. I didn't appreciate anybody sitting out here calling you guys racist because I know that you're not and neither are we. We provide care to everybody. So she also talked about spreading diseases among children. STDs and herpes are huge among our teenage community. You have a teenager, so do I. They graduated together. What are we doing about this madness? Are we trying to help them? Are we educating them? Are we on a mad dash? Are we going ballistic, trying to quarantine them before they start giving each other STDs? Because they are. Can they die from those STDs? Yeah, do you know what HIV is? They can't, and I don't see anybody trying so hard to protect our children from that. She talked about Israel. 
Israel also announced that natural immunity is best. I have antibodies. Why would you make me take something for something I already have antibodies for? Have you looked at a patient with polio and said, you need the vaccine? You need the polio vaccine. Do we do that? That's ridiculous. We don't do that. Moderna, let's talk about Moderna. Tell me what they've produced that has been approved by the FDA. Name me one. The answer is zero. They have never produced anything that's been approved by the FDA. Did you know? I don't think you know. I don't think you're aware. We're waiting on Moderna FDA approval. Why? Do you know that pregnant women should not be getting this Moderna or Pfizer or any vaccine for that matter? Do you want to know why? There has not been a perfect gestation period of time where a pregnant woman delivered a normal full-term baby. It hasn't been tested. Why? It hasn't been nine months. We're not dogs, we're not cattle. There's a nine month time period here. So you can see the vaccine came out in January. What month are we in? Have there been full-term babies born? The answer is no. So why would you tell pregnant women take this vaccine? If somebody can do that, and say those words, that tells me everything I need to know about their character. They're unethical and they're lying. And here I am being the voice of reason again, because I'll be there in that hospital to wrap, treat your patients, your, your family thought. members. Yeah. yeah, I just want you to know you are going to have a health care crisis and they don't have a plan. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh -huh. um, so I just want to make it quick. Um, I listened to what uh, the doctor spoke um, in regards to the schools and their protocols, and she's not giving the correct information. Name. Jessica Clymer, sorry. Um, my daughter actually was exposed at school. She was within her six feet realm, literally like an inch within the six feet realm, and had to quarantine for 10 days. So she mentioned that they're allowing antigen testing for allowing the kids to stay at school, and that's incorrect. I was told that my school district is only allowing a PCR test. They don't do the PCR test, they're not allowed back on campus. But if they do the PCR test and they don't have test results, they can still return to campus, which doesn't make sense because you don't know if that child is positive or negative. So you're allowing them to return pending test results to then what? Spread it if they're positive? But the students who are vaccinated can stay on campus. Um, her presentation also stated that if they're both masks, they can stay in with the testing. Um, that's not what the schools are telling the parents. So that information that she's providing to you guys is incorrect. Same districts and different schools are giving different outcomes. You know, one friend of mine who has an elementary student and a junior high student, the elementary student wasn't allowed back until the test results were there. The junior high student is allowed back regarding, uh, regardless of the testing results. Um, so it would be really nice if one of these days she actually stays and listens to the questions that we personally have for her because she's providing this data and information to you guys, but we're seeing it firsthand. We're seeing our students missing out. None of the schools have any idea what they're doing with these students when they're home. My daughter stayed home for eight days and she had no work. They didn't have anything to provide her. They had no way of teaching her. They had no way of anything. So she currently has all us in school because they had nothing to provide for her to do at home and their, their outcome is, She'll make it up when she gets back. So she now has to make up eight periods worth of work for the seven days she was gone, on top of what she's supposed to be learning currently. How is this fair to our children? This isn't fair to them. You're allowing a vaccinated student who can still catch and transmit COVID to continue to stay at school and not have to be tested. So why are they not testing everybody regardless? If you know that you can contract and spread it, vaccinated or not, why are they not testing everybody across the board? It shouldn't be segregated like that. It should be across the board. Same thing in hospitals. The reason why the testing has gone up so much is because they're forcing anybody who's unvaccinated to test twice a week starting August 23rd. So of course you guys are going to have an increase in vaccine or increase in testing because we all have to test. If you're not fully vaccinated or you're partially vaccinated, if you're not vaccinated, you're testing. That's going to be your increase in numbers. There's a lot of things that you guys asked her and I'm thankful that you guys are speaking up and asking questions, but she doesn't have answers to those things. She doesn't seem to have answers to anything and she won't listen to anybody from the public. 18 months ago when this all started, I was informed by my school that the reason why my junior high student couldn't go back but my elementary students could was because in between sixth and seventh grade, there's something in their throat that develops that allows them to catch COVID. When you ask the school district where you're getting that information from, she was the one presenting that to the schools. 
So she's presenting false information to the schools that are then giving it out to the parents. When you ask her questions, she never responds to you. I've asked multiple questions to her multiple times on her live forums. She doesn't respond. So at what point are you guys going to help us? You guys let her present, but when can you guys have us ask questions, get answers for things that she should be answering if she's the one putting out this information for the community? I know you guys have a tough time in what you guys are doing, and I'm thankful that you guys are helping us and trying to speak out and doing what you can, and I'm very thankful for that. Thanks. Thank you. And I can assure you that Dr. V watches the, uh, even though she's not here, she does watch for sure. All right, seeing no more public comment, I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment period. And we're going to move on to the consent calendar. I'm going to, going to pull one item off the consent calendar, and that is uh, B7, A, yeah, B7. And would any board member like to pull any other item? Would anyone like to comment on any item that's on the consent calendar? All right, seeing none, I'll take a motion to approve the consent calendar minus B7. All uh, items, uh, motion to approve all items except for item B7. Okay, we have a motion, do we have a second? Second. We have a second, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries unanimously. B7, uh, I think we wanted to pull and I'm gonna ask the sheriff to come forward. And B7 for the public is the approval of the agreement of the sheriffs uh, to retire one canine from the sheriff's canine unit. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for doing that. Uh, today is a, a special day. It is also somewhat a, a sad day. So as you can see, obviously, K-9 Kuma with his handler and uh, colleague there, his partner, uh, Deputy Victor Reno, uh, we are uh, looking to retire K-9 Kuma today. It is his ninth birthday. He has been with the Sheriff's Office for six years, and he was featured on the show America's Top Dog. Uh, where he and Deputy Victorino uh, competed. Um, unfortunately, it's a sad day because he, uh, Kenan Kuma, has cancer, and so it's time for him to retire. Uh, very rare and unusual cancer for a dog to get, but uh, it does take him off the streets. Uh, but we just wanted to, to talk about that uh, briefly and thank uh, both our furry partner here and uh, his handler uh, for their service. So, Mike, bring him on yeah. down. Tails are wagging. Hop up here. <laughs> I just want to thank all you guys for the opportunity that a lot of you guys have met him and met me. And uh, I just want to really thank you guys for the opportunities that you've given not only myself, but our whole department and our K-9 unit. And we appreciate that. It, it's important. And when you're at, on patrol by yourself out in the unincorporated area, we can't put two deputies. So we have two deputies. One of them happens to have fur. And you did, uh, you did us proud on TV, I just want you to know. And I want you to tell me what's Kuma's best arrest, apprehension. Uh, I would say probably his, one of his most recent ones, there was a carjacking out in Riverbank. He, uh, I think it was about 250 yards, he chased the guy down in Orchard. So that was probably, probably his good staple to end on. That's as good as they come. <laughs> do, you, do, you mind if the, do you mind if the five of us come down and take a picture with Absolutely. you, with Kuma? I'd love to. I know, right? Mm -hmm. right. It's a nice
that is all that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Very nice. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Gary Baird, who's here, we had a consent item to um, approve today, so I wanted to let him know that it got approved. And Gary's been a big supporter of the K-9 unit and uh, a lot to do with that, so thank you for that. But I wanted to let you know, because you might have thought that there was a bigger process, but it was a consent item and it got approved <laughs> by the entire board. Yeah, so thank, thank you, you for the service you provide to the community. Okay, now we need to go back to item B7 for a motion to approve. Motion to approve. I'll second. 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 Uh, Supervisor Condit. Condit, beat me. Yep. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Again, motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to move on to a public hearing. It's to conduct a public hearing to consider the Planning Commission's recommendation <laughs> of approval to rezone application uh, PLN 2019-0108 price Honda. And I'm going to turn it over to Angela to start. No, not to Angela. We're going to get Jeremy's presenting today. Yep. All right, thank you. So good morning, Chair Chiesa, board members, CEO Diedrich, County Council Bowes, Jeremy Ballard, Associate Planner. Um, I'm here to present to you uh, the rezone application for price Honda Perlock. This is a request to rezone a 5.14 acre parcel from an expired plan development 209 to a new plan development to allow for the construction of an auto dealership in two phases. The project site is located on North Golden State Boulevard between West Barnhart and West Taylor Roads in the Keys and Turlock area. The project site is a general plan designation of plan development. The plan development designation is intended for land that may be suitable for a variety of uses because of demonstrably unique characteristics. The project's proposed plan development zoning would be consistent with this uh, site's general plan designation. The staff believes that the proposed rezone to a new plan development would be consistent with the county's general plan overall. As I was saying, the project site is currently zoned PD209, which was previously approved for auto sale uses. However, the parcel did not develop within the approved development schedule. Thus, the zoning is now expired and requires a rezone for any development. Additionally, a development restriction easement was placed on the site by um, the city of Turlock and the previous property owner restricting the site for um, automobile uses until 2033. And during the process of the application, the city no longer felt the easement was necessary. And after a tax sharing agreement between the county and Turlock was finalized, the easement was removed from the property. The tax sharing agreement was approved by this board in October of 2020. Um, subsequently, the proposed zone, um, proposed plan development zoning would include new standards for parking, lighting, landscape, and signage, each of which were included in the proposed development plan. we we'll touch on those a little bit later. The site is surrounded by a mobile home park and ranch that's to the north. Um, the price for the car dealership is to the east. Commercial development in the city of Turlock to the south and State Route 99 and also commercial development is to the west. The site itself has not been developed with any structures and is currently vacant. The proposed development of an auto dealership will take place within two phases. Um, the first phase would include construction of the auto dealership building. That will include areas for a showroom, parts, storages, offices, and service areas, as well as construction of the reception canopy, an express service center, and a car detail building. So in consultation with the neighboring property owners to the north, the applicant has proposed um, to amend the site plan following the August 5th Planning Commission meeting um, to re relocate the Express Service Center, which you can see here in green. Um, this is to align uh, the, this building with the northern portion of the main dealership building. Um, although uh, this is not fully discussed in the agenda report before you, the revised site plan also includes minor building enlargements for operational efficiency and rearrangement of the total vehicle inventory on site. The revisions are minor in nature and could be approved by staff under uh, staff approval application, which not, would not require further planning commission consideration. So with that, the proposed revisions. Phase one will include the construction of a 35 foot tall, 33,140 square foot auto dealership building. And that should come up with the color there, outlining the building. And this is an um, increase of 3,480 square feet from what was considered by the planning commission. 
There will also be a 3,486-square-foot reception canopy, canopy which is um, outlined in yellow. Um, this is an increase of 1,438 square feet uh, from what the Planning Commission considered. And then the uh, Express Service Center, which is 2,490 square feet, an increase of 390 square feet. And then lastly, the uh, cart detail building over there in purple um, at 1,500 square feet, uh, which that did not change in size. In total, the proposed phase one development would consist of 40,616 square feet of building space. Additionally, phase one will develop the site with 293 paved parking stalls for vehicle inventory, employees, and customer parking. This will meet the county's off-street parking standard. The applicant also proposes construct an eight-foot tall masonry wall along the northern property line and install light poles 25 feet in height throughout the parking lot area. The site will have access to Northgate Golden State Boulevard by way of a shared driveway with the existing Price Ford dealership. The applicant will construct roadway and pedestrian improvements in the way of curb gutter sidewalk across the site's frontage and also be required to extend the center line concrete median and southbound uh, dedication turn lane. Hours of operation proposed to be Monday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. and Sunday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The applicant anticipates 24 employees on a maximum shift and up to 35 customers per day. As included in the city county tax sharing agreement, the project will be served by the city of Turlock for public water and sewer services with an out of boundary service agreement through LAFCO. The applicant proposes to begin construction of phase one within one year of project approval. Phase two proposes a 3,600 square foot expansion to the service bay of the main building, which is gonna be outlined in red. Um, phase two is anticipated to begin construction within 10 years of project approval. The applicant has also proposed a landscape plan that will include a 15 foot wide landscape strip consisting of various low water use trees, shrubs, and ground cover. The parking lot will, will also include landscaping in the form of shade trees and various plants and ground cover. Additionally, to be in co compliance with the county's agricultural buffer, the applicant will utilize the proposed eight foot tall masonry wall and include dense evergreen trees or shrubs, excuse me, along the northern property lines for screening purpose. That red line is just kind of highlighting where that, that wall and that landscaping will, will lie on the property. So as you can see, the elevations um, for the proposed building, this is also based on the revised site plan, um, the facade facing mostly south and east uh, of the, on, along the parcel. Um, additionally, with these proposed revisions to the site plan, um, the express service center will no longer include roll-up doors. Um, that open to the northern property lines. So there'll be a um, solid material matching the main building. Those areas are pointing where that, that area where that express service center would be located. And then lastly, the applicant has proposed a sign plan that includes a 60 foot, 65 foot tall freeway sign, a 17 foot tall monument sign, a five foot directional sign and various wall mounted signs. And these are the design there. So the county's general plan requires consultation with the city of Turlock for consideration of the project as this particular site is within one mile of their LAFCO adopted sphere of influence um, and within the city of Turlock's general plan study area. However, general plan policies also reserve the county's right for final discretionary action in these cases. Um, the city's responded to the project uh, referral requesting that city development standards be placed on the project, um, requiring it to be met for signage, landscaping, as well as hazardous material storage, filtration for stormwater runoff, and pavement of drive aisles. Additionally, the city requested payment of citywide impact fees that the applicant also obtain an encroachment permit for connection to water and sewer services, as well as paying any, any appropriate connection fees. These results have been added to the project's uh, development standards. However, the applicant's proposed 65 foot tall freeway sign would not meet city standards for development, as the city requires a minimum of 20 acres to be eligible for a freeway related sign. The applicant has requested this development standard not be added to the project. So here's a small sampling of freeway signs within the vicinity of the project. The sign, uh, sign to the left is actually within the city of Charlock and just would be an example of their current freeway signage design standards. Um, the sign to the right would be signage associated with the, with the previous Woods Furniture business located on the west side of State Route 99 and the Taylor exit. Here is, um, on the left is a signage for Peterbilt, which is east of State Route 99, and then on the right is the existing Price Ford dealership, um, east, also east of 99. Uh, additionally, previous discretionary projects uh, that were approved, um, Best RV and 
Best RV Center and Elam Inc., both of which are located west of State Route 99, State Route 99 included development standards um, that required meeting the City of Turlock standards uh, for their requested replacement signage. Um, while county staff is in support of requiring the proposed project, uh, excuse me, the proposed project sign plan meet the city standards, staff does understand that automotive, automotive manufacturers require specific on-site signage and failure to do so could prohibit use of the brand uh, by the dealership. So after publishing the report, planning staff received six letters of opposition to the project from adjacent neighbors, the majority of which have uh, identified residents on Barnhart Road. The letters were included as correspondence to the Planning Commission. The letters touched on various issues caused by the existing dealership and raises concerns with the development of the new dealership. Um, the issues focus on speeding down Barnhart Road by employees and those test driving vehicles, generation of dust by uh, use of the vacant project site, light intrusion by security lights, lighting, noise from car alarms, um, noise from vehicle deliveries, music, and operating later in the evening. Prior to receiving the letters of opposition, uh, attached one of the agenda report discussed compatibility concerns with the proposed dealership and the mobile home and mobile home park and ranchettes to the north of the project site. The report highlighted the construction of an eight foot tall masonry wall with dense evergreen landscaping along the northern property line as well as limited openings on the north side of the building would ultimately limit noise exposure to the parcels to the north. Additionally, pavement of the site would also limit the generation of dust. Um, additionally, staff has placed a development standard on the project that prohibits the use of a public announcement system by the business. Additionally, pursuant to CEQA, the proposed project's initial study was circulated to interested parties and responsible agencies for review and comment. No significant impacts were identified in the initial study and the negative declaration has been prepared for approval um, as part of approval for the project as it will not have a significant effect on the environment. Development standards reflecting referral responses have been placed on the project. So the Planning Commission considered the project at a public hearing on August 5th, 2021. During the public hearing, one person, Sharon Turnbull, spoke in opposition of the project. Ms. Turnbull, a resident of Barnhart Road, stated her concerns with the project were due to previous issues related to the operation of Price Ford, which included generation of dust and noise on the vacant project site, as well as speeding of employees and customers down Barnhart Road. Ms. Turnbull stated that she spoke with the applicant prior to the meeting and that she would not be opposed to the project if the test driving route excluded Barnhart Road. She also requested that a good neighbor policy be instituted. The project applicant, James Figueroa, and the project architect, Nick Seward, spoke in favor of the project. Mr. Seward dis discussed how the development of the site, including paving, landscape, and construction of the masonry wall would solve the issues described by Ms. Turnbull, as well as the, those outlined by the letters of opposition. He also answered questions by the commissioners related to the proposed stormwater basin. Ms. Figueroa stated, Mr. Figueroa stated that the existing dealership has a policy not to use Barnhart Road for test drives, and it would work to ensure his employees follow it. He also agreed to institute a hotline for neighbors to reach him directly. After the close of the public hearing, the commissioners deliberated the project, as um, well as the, the, the deletion of development standard related to the uh, signage request from the city of Turlock to meet their standards, as well as uh, discussion of inclusion of a good neighbor policy. Commissioners Marion and Buner agreed that State Route 99 is not a scenic setting and a freeway sign um, is designed to attract attention, which would be good for the business. Uh, Chairman Zipser stated that he was happy to see a good neighbor policy be added to the project. Um, ultimately, the Planning Commission, on a vote of 5-0, to zero, recommended approval of the project to the Board of Supervisors, including recommendation of deletion of development standard number 36, thus removing the requirement, or thus recommending to remove the requirement to meet the city's signed standards, as well as a new development standard requiring a good neighbor policy, as suggested by staff um, during the meeting. Uh, language for the new standard can be found in the body of your agenda report this morning. Subsequent to the Planning Commission meeting, the applicants, applicant submitted a draft good neighbor policy to the staff, which included provisions for the test driving route, test control prior to mowing of the site, and complaint procedures including multiple methods for making contact with the dealership management, and standards for the complaint to be answered. The draft policy can, can be found in attachment four of the agenda report. Um, staff has actually asked the applicant to include additional items into the final policy, such as uh, prohibition of use of the site until the dealership is developed, as well as um, additional protocols for distribution of the initial policy and any future modifications so the neighbors will get a copy of that. 
So included in the good neighbor policy is the um, a testing test driving route. So this is uh, the route here. This will be the first route which utilizes a track along uh, North Golden State Boulevard, East Keys Road, Mountain View Road, and West Taylor Road. And then the Route 2 will utilize State Route 99. So additionally, a complaint was received on August 21st, 2021 by a resident of the mobile home park. The resident stated that the existing dealership employees continue use, continued to use the vacant project site, which is generating dust. As stated previously, once the site is developed with asphalt, generation of dust on the site will be minimal and the good neighbor policy will include provisions for watering of the vacant parcel to reduce dust until development. Um, consequently, as required by the development standards for the project site, uh, the vacant site cannot be used for, utilized for employee parking or any other use until fully developed. Um, the use of the site will be included, in, be included in the final good neighbor policy as discussed before. So to conclude, staff recommends that the Planning Commission, um, excuse me, staff states that the Planning Commission has recommended project approval to the Board of Supervisors, including findings related to the environmental review, rezone findings, and findings for road improvements and project approval. So that concludes staff's presentation, and we can answer any questions. Thank you. Um, you staff added, you said, no use of the lot until it's fully developed. Was that post-Planning Commission or pre-Planning Commission? This would be post-Planning Commission as okay. they, we've received a draft good neighbor policy between Planning Commission and, and now um, we're asking for additional amendments to be included in the final uh, good neighbor policy. Okay, so you just received that today, the good neighbor policy? Is that what I heard you say? No, we received it last week. I'm okay. It's part of between Planning Commission and today. That's when those changes have been asked. And then you're trying to add, repeat to me exactly what you're trying to add on to the good neighbor policy beyond. I know there were a couple things. I, I'm here too busy looking at <laughs> maps and everything else. If I can clarify before Jeremy goes there. So the, the Planning Commission wanted a good neighbor policy added in. The good neighbor policy kicks in at the time that they need to come in for a building permit. Staff included a draft good neighbor policy that we've been working with the applicant on in your board agenda item. We're not asking for that to be approved as part of this item. It's just a draft to show both the neighbors and the board what the general scope of the good neighbor policy will be. And Jeremy was just clarifying that we have asked, asked for some additional modifications, um, some of which are directly related to the complaint that we received post the Board of Supervisors agenda being released. And it comes down to use of that site at this time does not, really there is no permitted use of that site. So use of the site for delivery of vehicles or for driveways or for parking of vehicles is not permitted at this time. So there shouldn't be any complaints being received because we shouldn't be using the site. I'm looking on an overhead map and I can see 100 vehicles, but it looks like they rocked a portion of the, that area to keep dust down. Is that where they parked them? Again, I'm I believe so, yeah. Yeah, over the last couple of years, I mean, anybody who drives that corridor can see that Price Ford has been using that site to park, to park vehicles on it. It's not permitted under the zoning that's there now, and it's not permitted under the request that is coming in here at this point. I think one thing that we learned um, during the Planning Commission meeting that we were not aware of was that they were bringing um, vehicle delivery via trucks in the north side along the mobile home park, which was kicking up dust and creating noise, and that was a condition that we were not aware of. And is that a basin behind the current Ford dealership right now? Is that the drainage basin? There, there you, let me get the laser pointer here. This over here is the, the basin for the Ford dealership. That is a basin, okay. Because you can see in the picture, I know exactly why they're utilizing that. I mean, there's, there's no place else to put vehicles, and this is similar to across the street at Best RV. So, uh, again, I haven't talked, I, and I don't see James here, but I, I'm sure there's there's someone on his behalf. Okay, we'll ask. Any other questions before we open it up? No questions? Okay. So, I'm going to head and open the public hearing. Allow the applicant to come forward first.
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nick Seward. I'm the architect for the project. Unfortunately, James Figurell, um, the client in the applicant, is unable to be here for, uh, due to an illness. So I'm here to answer any questions you guys might have um, regarding the project. Uh, so the good neighbor policy, I, I look at it and it looks to make absolute sense to me. Are you guys able to operate without utilizing the additional space? Yeah, currently um, the site, as you can see, is pretty tight at the price forward. Um, they have been operating using that adjacent site for many years. Um, to James's knowledge, there hasn't been any complaints until this project has come forward for the price Honda. So um, they're a little baffled by that and they wish to continue to use that site. Um, I think mainly they park employees. I do know that James has already changed the vehicle deliveries to not occur on that site at all. They do now occur on the Price Ford project. Um, so I know that was a complaint that they did mitigate. Okay. Uh, I'm just thinking. I'm processing. I'm sorry. Yeah, and they have been <laughs> watering the site. Yeah. Um, I know they've watered it recently um, to help with the dust as well. The project is likely going to be a 12 to 14 month build out. Um, when do you expect to start? They would like to start um, immediately. We would be submitting for permit likely by the end of this year. Um, so probably sometime in spring of next year would be start of construction would be my guess. So, so I'm just getting this, sorry. So the problem is while we're waiting for this to be built, they can't use this anymore. That's is, is what the problem is based on the good neighbor policy. Sorry, it just clicked, it just kicked in there. No. If I may clarify, the good neighbor policy really, it's getting intertwined into the good neighbor policy because of the complaints that are coming forth. But already under the, gen, right now, the site is being used in a manner that's not permitted to be used and has been for many years. And, you know, what we're trying to address at this point is just the complaints. Um, between now and the time that the site actually develops and then all of these complaints go away. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily really a feature of the good neighbor policy, um, but in trying to address it, you know, we're just trying to be all inclusive. Mm -hmm. yeah. But by no means are we trying to get to a point where we would restrict um, the operation in their ability to operate, you know, the current dealership. But we do need to be respectful of the neighbors and the fact of what is permitted and not permitted on that site currently. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? So timeline into the year, and you said how many months to build? About 12 to 14. 12 to 14 months. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We'll call you back up if we have any other questions. Thank you. I do have one speaker card from Sharon Turnbull. Good afternoon. My name is Sharon Turnbull. I reside at 4124 West Barnhart Road, but I also own three more parcels behind this. Um, when first came in with Patch or Price Ford, it was Patch at the time. Ed Garcia was the owner. Um, we had the good neighbor policy basically verbally, and if we had a problem with cars driving up and down the road, we could call the Ford dealership at that time, and it was taken care of. You know, we try to be good neighbors out there. We got fourth and fifth generations out here. Um, when it's been taken over now with Price Ford, it's like a racetrack out there. And so we addressed this and we talked to um, Jeffrey, I believe it is. Jeremy. Jeremy out there and he said he would definitely address it. They didn't realize that was going on. These car deliveries are coming in like at two, three, four o'clock in the morning. And with all that big space on that site, they, they stay close to the fence. I do on the mobile home park, two more par parcels past it, and then one on the other side, yeah. But anyway, um, I've called there a couple of times. Um, the number he gave us is for a lady named Chris, Chris, Christine. And she said she would look into it. Since the last meeting we were there, I myself called on five cars going down the road. The other thing is, is they came out and brought a, not a bush hog, a flail, and tried to knock down weeds that are about four feet tall, three to four feet tall. And the flail didn't work. They got a couple passes in there. 
which was good, and they did try to get a truck out there and give us some water and stuff. Um, the employees were still parking over there. In fact, somebody stole one and drove it through the fence there at the mobile home park. Um, we've got a lot of theft going on out there. I guess everybody does now. But anyway, I have a real problem with that not having water when it's either the flail or a bush hog out there trying to take it down. One time they covered the whole area there, that triangle, with walnut shells. <clears throat> Excuse me. Walnut shells. And another time I think they put out almonds or something else out there too. And there's a couple of pipes out there also. But this is getting to be, it was, and I had told him also that this is getting to be a real nuisance with the racing and stuff down the road. And he said he'd addressed it. I also talked to the planner. I've also told him we've had plans here, or, or problems here, with it still going on. And they assured us that they would take care of it. Other neighbors, we basically had a little street meeting. And they're still witnessing the cars going down the road and stuff. And um, I said, we just have to be patient on this. But these big trucks coming in out of Benicia were delivering these things. I mean, be sound asleep and sound like you got a semi right next to your bed is just pretty exciting. Especially the average age in that park is 76. I've got 198. I've got one as high as 62. So we are an older community. We're nothing fancy. But we do try to keep our areas clean and neat. But this, this is something's got to be done here, and it's got to be done now. And I really would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank Any you very questions? much. Uh, nope. Sharon, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. That's the only speaker card I have on this item. Anyone else? OK. I'll bring it back to the board for comments. I, I, I guess I'll go first. And I completely agree with the good neighbor policy. and. Uh, it, it appears, again, it appears uh, it, that they're not going to be utilizing Barnhart Road. If I lived on Barnhart Road, I'd feel the same way uh, because it's a country road. It's not, it's not a main thoroughfare like Golden State is or Taylor or Keys. So I liken the good neighbor plan, the circulation element, and it really will fall on uh, James and, and to, to ensure that. Um, the unloading trucks taking semis out into the open field makes no sense either, and I think that's being addressed right now. The concrete barrier plus the uh, landscape plan uh, on uh, abutting the north side of that property, again, makes absolute sense. And, and the only thing that concerns me is there's employee parking, and probably, you know, based on what I saw in inventory when I drove by here a few days ago, it's probably easy now for folks to park in the parking lot because there's no inventory. It's not going to be like that forever. That's pretty much every car lot. But I, I and, and generally I'm very supportive of staff's recommendation because this site is not supposed to be utilized for parking. But if it's just vehicle, uh, small vehicle parking and you keep it watered, I think we buy them the 13 or 14 months to get through, uh, understanding that no one should go out in the field. I, again, I'm looking at a picture. It's a little different than the one that you brought up, but they're out in the field. There are vehicles in the field, and that's not, um, you know, this is just the, the overhead of whenever they took this picture. Uh, but I think that they can get by without it. I, and if they only parked on the property line on the, what do you call it, the east side, and not going out, it looks like they rocked it. Uh, so I'm okay with that. The, as far as the sign, uh, I, I would agree that uh, I know the Honda dealership or Honda is actually determining the site of the uh, sign. This is going to be a good project in the end. It's taken us a long time to get through the tax sharing agreement conversation with Turlock and get to this point. I'm sure the applicant is going to pay a whole bunch more for construction now than uh, when they should have been building this. And you know. Uh, government never works fast enough in certain situations, and we put up lots of impediments. That's what we do. But it's for public safety, and it's for the neighbors uh, to make sure that they're not unduly impacted. So I'm, I'm going to be supportive with those conditions. But again, I, because I go by there enough, just like I do everything else, if I see vehicle creep anywhere out into the field, uh, I'll stop by and tell you. And and so. You call my office if people are driving on Barnhart Road, and you can snap a picture. I, I feel very confident they won't do that uh, because of the good neighbor policy, but those are some of my thoughts. I'm going to agree with everything you said, and I just want I know this has been going on for 
two years at least, oh, probably longer than that. Four years. Four years. Yeah, yeah this has been a, a lifelong project, and it is. it has been a slow crawl for everybody and painful. But I just want to commend staff for working so hard on this, commend Vito for I know how hard you've worked to try to make this happen and working with Turlock. So I know this has been a nightmare um, for everybody, but it looks like we're finally getting near the finish line here. And, and I agree as far as um, the parking, you know, we're just going to have to monitor that and hopefully make this all work until we get to the point where this thing is dead. But I want to commend everybody and Vito, I know how hard you've worked on making this happen. So, and staff to make this happen. So thank you all for getting us to this point. And sorry it took so long. Uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about the tax sharing agreement. If you, can you pull back a little bit on, yeah, there you go. So the, the Taylor Road interchange needs improvements and it's in the city, but uh, you know, the county has a responsibility because of the traffic generated over to Best RV and to the um, Ford dealership. And so as a part of the tax sharing agreement, uh, both the county and the city through sales tax proceeds are setting aside a million dollars and to improve the Taylor Road intersection because when you're southbound and you get off and you have the stop sign as you're going to get on a uh, southbound it is a dangerous situation there and it, they've done a fantastic job Turlock did on Fulker Road interchange and and so the plans it won't happen fast because these projects are very expensive I think the last time they priced it out, it was about 13 or 14 million dollars. But we're setting aside enough money to help do the design work, and again, a good partnership with the city of Turlock to improve that intersection. So, with that, if there's no other comments, okay, the motion, the motion's going to include Planning Commission's recommendation of is it 26 item 26 on signage? Uh, 36. 36. Uh, so we're going to ratify the Planning Commission. With 36 and also add in there uh, parking not in the field but on the little bit of uh, rocked area that's okay um, I, the, the parking we can handle that independent of okay. this we've heard okay. the board loud and clear and we can work with, with the applicant on that I think your motion will be as outlined in the staff recommendations on um, item number five which will be the Planning Commission's recommendation with the attached development standards, including approval to, re including the revised site plan that was in attachment five. Okay, I will make that motion. Angela's motion. That's Angela's good. Do we have motion. a second? Second. I have a second. First and second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries five zero. Can, can I just do a little side note, Angela, before you leave? Just. I know, sorry. No, no, please go. I noticed 5 0 vote, so we only had five people to the Planning Commission. How's that going? I know we've got things in place as far as attendance for the Planning Commission. Um, don't we have, didn't we try to put in some things, some um, rules and policies with regard to attendance if you don't attend a certain? Anyway, I'm just, yeah. when I see that, it's just yeah. discouraging. So. I, I think generally our Planning Commission has been doing really well as far as attendance goes. I think life just gets in the way, and I think this may have gone to meeting before before the 4th of July or was in that room. There, there was just, it just happened to be a bad meeting with okay. a lot of conflicts. But in general, I think our, our, our planning commission is doing a pretty good job on attendance. So we've got nine people on the planning commission and it sounds like that was just a bad day. Yeah, life just happens okay. sometimes right. and that was the case. If you're good with that, well, we're good with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna move on to discussion item 8-1. Approval to proclaim August 31st, 2021 as Overdose Awareness Day in Stanislaus County. And I believe Ruben will be starting out and in introducing Melinda. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Good morning, uh, Chairman Chiesa, Board of Supervisors, Assistant Executive Officer, Chief District, and um, our Council Bows. I'm here, to here this morning um, to uh, present, uh, along with um, our community partners, an approval to proclaim August 31st as Overdose Awareness Day in Stanislaus County. 
I'm going to invite uh, Melinda Pilato. Um, she is part of uh, the Stanislaus County Opioid Safety Coalition. And I'm also joined here today with other coalition members, uh, Jennifer Marsh, Dr. Mora, Dr. Krauss, and uh, Jeff Dirksky is also part of the coalition. And our agenda item outlined um, challenges within our community related to um, what we are experiencing local, locally as a, an overdose um, an, uh, an overdose crisis. And Stanislaus County is not alone. Um, this is uh, being experienced across the state of California and our country. And um, we are here to, again, to ask for a resolution. And again, our agenda item outlines the challenges. But what we thought we would do differently here today is to share, um, in addition to that information, um, a personal story and experiences about this issue. So I am inviting Menenda Pallada to come up and to present. And uh, we do have the slide advances, so you can go ahead and do that. Good morning. It's great to see some familiar faces and to see some new ones. Hold on. Um, can, can you raise that up just a little bit? How's that? Is that better? OK. It's great to see some familiar faces and to meet some new ones. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, for those of you I haven't met, as you heard, I'm Melinda Pallada. I reside here in California with my husband and our six children. Um, they're adult children. My youngest son and his family and my four bonus children live here in California. And my oldest son lives in heaven. You can advance. Point it this That's way. right. I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, so yes, today is uh, Overdose Awareness Day. This is actually an internationally recognized day. The uh, day was first recognized in Australia some years back. This is a problem not only in our community, not only in our state or nation, but this is worldwide. Um, as you can see from the slide, there are several objectives. Um, last year, we lost 93,000 lives here uh, in, in the nation to overdose, and the stats are rising. The last I heard is one to two young people per week. Uh, this topic is very uh, near and dear to my heart because um, it was an accidental overdose that took my oldest son's life. I'd like you to meet my beautiful boy. This is Zach. Um, December 9, 1987, I became a mom for the first time. Uh, before I continue, I have to tell you this, this story is probably not going to be that different from many people in our community, and that alone just breaks my heart. Um, but Zach was a bright, bubbly little boy. You can see his little sense of humor there. Um, and he grew to be a handsome young man with a love of outdoors. He was an avid hunter, um, excelled in most sports that he tried his hand at, and a very gifted musician as well. He had a great sense of humor, a warm smile, and a big heart. Notice the change in my beautiful boy's demeanor. Uh, his, ta his teen years were turbulent times. Um, he was my oldest son, so I didn't have anything to go by as to what was normal behavior and what wasn't. Uh, unfortunately, his father and I went through a divorce, and Zach was crossed, uh, caught in the crossfire. Um, I believe certain aspects of that divorce contributed to his addiction. I had no idea at the time, uh, of course, but later learned that um, he began taking opioids at age 11 when he took them from a family member's prescription bottle. In 2012, Zach reached out to me for help. He said his addiction was out of control and admitted to using oxy and alcohol. Um, this was something un unknown to me, I, and I didn't know really how to deal with that. Uh, my husband and I flew him to California and put him into a rehab facility where he tested positive for cocaine, marijuana, oxy, and alcohol. It was on his 24th birthday. He did go through the program. I can tell you three months is not long enough to undo that type of a strong addiction. But uh, this is, these are pictures that are very near and dear to me. Uh, you can see his sense of humor. Um, I loved these pictures for several reasons. You could actually see what I called his root beer eyes. When he wasn't using, you could see his pupil. I could see him in there. 
Um, and this is also hours before he rededicated his life, clean and, clean and sober, at a Christmas Eve service. I know where he is, but I miss him terribly. Um, this is the last day that I saw my son. Uh, this was actually on my birthday. Um, we had gone up to Yosemite. Uh, as a little guy, he, he played hockey, and I was always tightening his skates. And one of my cherished memories is I tried to skate out on the ice, and he looked at me and said, Mom, your skates are loose. Let me tighten your skates, just as I had tightened his so many years before. I could tell at that time he had been struggling with his addiction. He didn't have his root beer eyes. It was almost as if he opened the door to his life long enough to interact. And then as we left, he closed it behind him. On November 16th, 2014, um, every parent's worst nightmare, uh, my world blew up. Um, we were getting ready to go to church. We were supposed to greet that morning. I saw the caller ID, and I thought that that was that calling. But instead, it was this unusual male voice telling me my son had passed sometime in the night. I was later told that it was uh, a combination of unprescribed methadone and alcohol that claimed his life. He was 26 years young. I have no words to describe the emotion I felt after losing him. I've put a few on this slide that I could think of. I spent about three months on the couch honestly unable to function. And looking back, I can see just how close to the edge I came. I'm not here to preach to you, but I can tell you, without my faith, I would have taken my life. My faith, along with the love and support of my family members, pulled me back from the edge. This is not a road that one can navigate alone. We need support. I still have days where the grief is overwhelming. Um, you can't anticipate the triggers. Uh, I know what they are, and I'm just doing what I can to take care of myself. But one thing I've done to help heal is to reach out to help others. As I had gained my strength years ago, uh, after losing him, um, I had to find out what happened to my beautiful, bubbly, cur curly-haired little boy. Bless you. I spent some time doing research on opioids, on addiction, uh, reflecting on my life, what had happened to him. The more I learned about addiction, the more I realized I knew so little, and I started to become concerned that there were other parents out there just as uninformed as I had been. So with the hope of sparing others some of the pain that I'm carrying with me still today, I began to do public speaking. We also formed a nonprofit. Uh, and I'm us we're using that as a voice to do some public speaking and hopefully uh, begin some fundraising efforts in anticipation of awarding some scholarships in the spring. One such event we're hosting is uh, tonight's event at our home church, Shelter Cove Community Church. Um, and I would invite all of you to come. This event will be an opportunity to bring comfort and a sense of community to those hurting hearts out there. The Safety Coalition has also been a tremendous source of support for me. I've been an active member since shortly after it was formed. Uh, this organization strives to make a difference by providing resources to the community, including education and treatment. And I stand before you as a representative of that fantastic organization. Overdose Awareness Day is uh, a, a respectful request that we make of you. We just lost a young girl last week, 14 years old, in our community. She was just a little girl. It's heartbreaking. So many people are hurting from losses like mine, and so many people are struggling with addiction like Zach struggled. On their behalf, on behalf of the coalition, on behalf of our foundation, I respectfully request that you proclaim today Overdose Awareness Day in Stanislaw County. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more, one more slide. You want to advance it one more? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I think your final picture, I just wanted Yes. And I don't know how to work this thing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> there we go. There's my son, my handsome boy. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Um, uh, um, 
oftentimes when we talk about these uh, issues, we bring you data reports and um, a variety of other information that we're doing to address these issues. And um, th there are quite a bit that the coalition is working towards in terms of educating the community, uh, media campaigns. Um, we've been expanding um, co uh, physician consultants and uh, physician consultation services to increase their capacity to address this issue as well. Um, working with Melinda, though, reminds us, and what we wanted to do today um, is to remind us um, of the, the real impacts in our community um, beyond our documents and the things we present. And over the last um, year or so, we have seen an acceleration in this issue, and we continue to work uh, to bring awareness to our community. And uh, we will continue to do that work over the next uh, several months. And um, no doubt you will hear more from us um, around some of those efforts and issues as we move forward. So, so this is a little, uh, little different than we usually do it, right? Uh, on when we proclaim something, typically it's just a presentation, not a discussion item. And today, and I, I should have let the board. I'll let you comment afterwards. I'm sorry, but. Uh, we put this on as a discussion item uh, just to highlight what Ruben had said. It is an absolute epidemic around here. Fentanyl, um, heroin, oxy, uh, the drug manufacturers, although I think that they're starting to curb that side, but the other is just as, just as available. And you know the, the police can only do so much. There's not enough drug and alcohol beds. We continue to always try and find expansions. I was going to say that uh, a few years ago I went over to uh, Aegis, I think it's called Aegis, uh, where they give methadone to try and get people uh, treated. The county also has a uh, methadone clinic. But you will walk in there, and I was just trying to see, uh, try and figure out if we're doing some good. And, and the people that are sitting there getting their methadone look just like you and I. It, it was truly amazing, and I think there's a perception that it's not. Uh, and Zach is a, uh, that is a perfect indication of a um, a, a good kid and he got caught, got hooked on it and, and it's so powerful that you can't stop yourself. And so it gave me a different perspective again in, in, in my life and, and the addictive process of all of these drugs. It's not just meth, uh, something different. These opioids are just completely addicting. And so uh, again, a good reminder, Melinda was a past employee until 2012 probably uh, right at that time. And I think you worked for General Services Agency, at least that's when I knew you. So uh, was that the only department you worked for? I started out in Health, health uh, Services Agency, HSA. and then I came to procurement. I was actually there till 2015. 2015. And now I'm uh, <coughs> in a cooperative purchasing organization. Still, I'm with a cooperative purchasing organiza organization still supporting Stanislaw County. Yay. Thank you very much. So uh, with that, I'm going to give you the gist of it. It's proclaiming August 31st as Overdose Awareness Day in Stanislaus County, whereas the Stanislaus County Board of Supervisors has recognized healthy communities as a priority, and whereas the Stanislaus County Board of Supervisors does affirm and acknowledge the harm and hardship caused by drug addiction and overdose. And whereas we recognize the purpose of Overdose Awareness Day uh, by remembering loved ones lost to overdose, and whereas people with a substance use disorder recover if provided the necessary treatment services and support from their communities and whereas stigma and fear of discrimination keep many who would benefit from substance use disorder treatment services from seeking help. Um, and I'm not going to read the rest of it, but it is, it is so important that we all recognize that if someone's, if you think someone's using and can use help, make sure you reach out to them. Don't assume that they're getting the help they need. Be a friend and we need to watch out for each other. But uh, therefore, be it resolved that the Stanislaus County Board of Supervisors does hereby unanimously proclaim August 31st, 2021 is Overdose Awareness Day in Stanislaus County. Thank you, Melinda, for coming in. Thank you all. This means a lot to me.
other suits and other programs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get one, two, three. Okay. Okay, on to item B2. Oh, yeah, we need to acknowledge. Yeah. I forgot to also ask for comments, and then I got to ask the audience if they, there's any more comments. You guys are okay? Yeah. Okay, anyone in the audience want to comment on this item? We're waiting for Manny to, waiting for Manny to come back here, too. I'll just, while we're waiting for Manny, please. I've, a couple times we've gone out to Aegis or also the methadone clinic. And I think the last time I went, I sat down with one of the doctors there. And, and it was just amazing to, as she described, um, you know, the addiction and how, like you said, to see people there that just, you know, we think it's somebody's weak, it's, we see somebody on the street, it's that type, but it's, it, it's, it could be any one of us. And as she sat there and described to me, um, how certain people's, you know, their DNA, how, how they react to these things and how they become addicted, it, it reminded me of, of myself <laughs> is what it did. It was very um, awakening for me just the, that everybody's got their um, different reactions and I don't know the inhibitors or whatever happens in the brain that makes you react to these things. So it's not people who are weak. It's not people who are, you know, are, it, it can happen to any one of us. It's just in your genes that whether you, how you react to these drugs and um, and become addicted to them. And so, as she described, the doctor described what happened. I could, I, I went back to a time where I had some. I'm killing time while Mandy's coming. I had this weird gum surgery. I'll never do it again. It, it was, it, but um, but they, they gave me these pain pills to um, to deal with for it. And um, and and it was just amazing. I took one of these pills and I could not believe how it made me feel. It was just this euphoric, you know, feeling from these things. And luckily, at that point, I realized I can never take one of these things again because that's all I would want to do is take these things. And so it's in your genes. It's in your DNA. And so it's not a weakness that people have. And, and as, as, as Melinda spoke of her son, it's, it's, it's unfortunately we're born with these things. And so it is a crisis that we're out there dealing with, and it can happen to any one of us. So, Thank you. Any other comments? Anyone in the audience want to comment? Okay. Oh, please. Stephen. I'll just say quickly, um, my wife and I have no children, but I lost my older brother to drug abuse when he was 35 years old. This is more than 30 years ago, and I saw how it ripped apart my father and the rest of the family. So it's just devastating, and you just don't know where it's going to come from. And this was, much of his abuse happened in the 70s and into the early 80s, where we didn't know as much as we do now. So it's just terrible. So, so it's, and as Mr. Withrow, yeah, it can happen to anybody. You just don't know when it's going to happen. Thank you for that comment. Seeing no one else for public comment, I'll bring it back to the board for action. Approve the proclamation. Make a motion to accept the presentation. All right. We have a motion and second. And a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you very much. Moving on to item 8-2, accept an update on the financial forecast and staffing plan to administer emergency medical services, functions internally in Stanislaus County. And Richard Murdoch will be presenting. Good morning, members of the board, Supervisor Chiesa, CEO Assistant Patrice Dietrich, and County Council. Richard Murdoch, County Fire Warden, Assistant Director of Office of Emergency Services, um, and so we are coming back to the board, we as in I, but there are others that have been working on this, uh, this uh, update on this plan. And uh, I'd like to recognize Jewel War and uh, Marianne Lilly as well. They've been participants in helping us put together this plan for a single county EMS design and this update. So to begin with, um, a team from Stanislaus County, including Supervisor Chiesa, 
originally met with a few members of the Mountain Valley EMS Agency Board on March 26th to discuss a desire to pull out of the JPA, providing some background on some of the challenges the county has had and also identifying anticipated benefits of a single county EMS agency. On March 30th, the Board of Supervisors supported the withdrawal from the JPA to be effective between October 1st and December 31st, 2021, and directed staff to coordinate with the other JPA participant counties to establish options and return to the Board within 60 days with a more detailed proposal for the future administration of EMS functions. An initial letter of intent to withdraw from the JPA was sent to Mountain Valley EMS Agency on March 31st, noting the planned time frame to be no later than December 31st. And then after subsequent meetings of the JPA and subcommittee, staff returned to the Board of Supervisors on May 25th, receiving approval to extend the effective date for withdrawal of Stanislaus County from the MVMSA JPA effective June 30th, 2022, providing more time for the remaining county JPA partners to identify their desired future model and allowing all partners to complete the current fiscal year under the existing model. An updated a letter of intent was issued to Mountain Valley EMS Agency on June 17th, identifying the updated time frame uh, for withdrawal. One benefit of the JPA structure is to uh, access uh, the funding by the state that is only available to multi-county uh, EMS agency, and a multi-county EMS agency that's eligible for reimbursement is three counties or more. The state funding currently amounts to approximately $300,000 annually. However, over the past decade, um, operational and structural issues have been identified resulting in arduous assessments and Board of Supervisors actions with limited or temporary results. The JPA is an independent entity reporting to five counties. The lack of control to set priorities and direct day-to-day -day operations based on Stanislaus County needs has again resulted in operational inefficiencies and strained relationships with lo local partners such as first responders, ambulance providers, hospitals, and public health. Additionally, Stanislaus County's needs are inherently different from those of the other counties within the GAPA due to its size and urban-suburban domain. Stanislaus County represents 84% of the population for all counties within the GAPA with over 60,000 EMS calls annually compared to an average annual call volume of about 6,700 for the other counties collectively. A high-performance emergency ambulance uh, service system is the delivery of clinical excellence, response time reliability, economic efficiency, and customer satisfaction. The coordination with pre-hospital specialty care centers, the medical health operational area coordinator known as the MOAC, and behavioral health 5150 crisis requires coordinated efforts and day-to-day -day oversight from the EMS agency staff. A single county EMS agency provides for local control, direction, responsiveness, and accountability to Stanislaus County leadership. An in-house organization can build relationships with local partners to increase confidence, enhance capabilities, and move forward with a high performance EMS system. When you compare the size and needs of Stanislaus County across the state, you see that similar counterparts operate under a single county design. Across California, there's 26 counties that operate as a single county EMS agency. There are six multi-county local EMS agencies representing 30 counties, which are predominantly rural. Regardless of the size of the county or the size of the local EMS agencies, there are eight functions that are um, required by the state of California. The size of the county and the call volume really drives the amount of time staff dedicates to performing these functions with efficiencies. Under the leadership of the sheriff, uh, the EMS will become a division of the fire warden um, and OES office, as you can see there on the right. When working to develop a financial forecast,
staff identified several considerations that require significant review and evaluation. While the existing Mountain Valley EMS Agency JPA budget serves as a starting point to evaluate the potential cost to provide EMS services in-house, there are distinctions between the activities involved in supporting a multi-county structure versus what we can expect to experience under a single county model. Due to the specific nature of the job functions required to provide EMS services, some job classifications will need to be studied and developed for the EMS specialist positions, including the associated uh, salary scale. Pulling the EMS functions in-house requires the additional considerations of how economies of scale may benefit the new division, operating under the Office of Emergency Service and the Sheriff's Office, which has a robust operational structure. Those revenues that will carry over to the new design require additional evaluation to ensure all available resources are considered. Once the appropriate number of staff and classifications are determined, we will be able to identify one-time startup costs needed to support the division. Finally, staff will need to determine the number of additional staff required to provide contract EMS services to the remaining Mountain Valley EMS Agency JPA counties. That is, if they desire the type of EMS structure along with the corresponding cost that would be charged to those counties. More time is needed to fully vet these various considerations and impacts on the financial forecast to provide reliable estimates. Staff will keep the board informed as these costs are identified and the overall plan takes shape. The Mountain Valley EMS Agency Board met on August 12th for a regularly scheduled meeting in which the board acknowledged Stanislaus County's intent to terminate membership in the JPA and a subcommittee assigned to identify alternatives for the remaining counties was tasked to be prepared to report on progress at a future meeting. A special meeting was held on, on uh, August 26th with the subcommittee reporting out that two other contiguous counties have expressed potential interest in joining the JPA. Additionally, discussion on the relocation of the Mountain Valley EMS Agency offices from Stanislaus County resulted in the agreement to use a county-owned facility central to the partner counties at no cost to the JPA. The subcommittee noted challenges in gathering additional information due to dual impacts from COVID-19 pandemic and the local fires. We anticipate further updates at future Mountain Valley EMS Agency JPA board meetings. The next steps, as you can see in September and December, we have scheduled biweekly meetings with staff from OES, the Sheriff's Office, HSA, and CEO departments. Classification study and salary determination is currently underway and we should have some results uh, here within the next month. Evaluation of all other costs is a continuing ongoing uh, evaluation for us. Analysis of estimated revenues, coordination with JPA counties, as well as determination on whether contracted services will be desired. In the month of January, January uh, recommendations to the board on structure, classification, staffing, and preliminary budget will be delivered. So staff recommendations, accept the progress report on the financial forecast and staffing plan for the internal capability within the Office of Emergency Services in the Sheriff's Department to administer emergency medical services functions effective July 1st, 2022. Authorize staff to develop a provision of emergency medical service administration to Alpine, Amador, Calaveras, and Mariposa counties under a cost-based contract should this be a desired option by these counties to be effective July 1st, 2022 and then direct staff to complete the analysis of emergency medical services, job classifications, and recommendations for Board of Supervisors consideration by January 25th, 2022. And with that, are there any questions? Any questions of staff? So it sounds like we're, we're making progress here. Yes, with sir. This. Did, did I hit, Richard, did you say that they were that the other counties were considering forming their own JPA. Did I hear that right? That was one of the options they were looking at? Yes. Okay. Or contracting with us as we've spoken of, and it sounds like potentially right. that could, could happen too. Just, I, I know I should know this, but how much does the county contribute to Mountain Valley EMS dollar-wise every year? What's our... Stanislaus County? Yeah. Uh, approximately $300,000. Okay, so that's our contribution to yes. it. Okay. Okay, that's it. 
thank you for the hard work. I know we've, we've um, been kind of pushing to make sure this works for the other counties very hard, and I appreciate your efforts for this. Thanks. Absolutely. Supervisor Condit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and uh, thank you, Chief, for, for the update. Uh, and thank you for meeting with me. I know Rich and I have been meeting now every week, uh, just trying to stay up to date. And just to give you a quick update, the subcommittee um, has been meeting. Um, obviously, I'm not part of that because then uh, the Brown Act would, would take effect. But uh, uh, they have been meeting, um, and they're dealing with a lot of issues up in our mountain counties as far as the fires and, yeah. and COVID. So um, I think they'll, we'll be far along, far along in our next meeting. So this is one of those moments when the Brown Act doesn't work. <laughs> and it just uh, because we're central to this conversation and Supervisor Condit is our primary on Mountain Valley EMS, I'm the alternate. So any meeting that is going on, we can't be present because it'd be a, a Brown Act meeting, it'd be a public meeting. And really it's about trying to, the subcommittee is really about trying to find a model that works for all the counties. And we know what we need out of it. I think we've expressed that. But, you know, it's, it's not about leaving the smaller counties behind. There's a reason that when you look at the groupings, you put that up, that the single counties generally are along the coast, larger counties, and because it's much more difficult for those small counties and on a, on a go forward basis. So, again, we'll continue to have conversations. I appreciate Supervisor Condit's. Uh, diligence because it's it's a tough one he came on the board he has a background in it so he understands the the fire side but this is even bigger so he's been drinking out of the fire hose for lack of a better word yep. for quite some time so appreciate you doing that I'm trying to think one of the things we we're talking about funding the vast majority of the funding does not come from the counties it comes from the, the hospitals and other sources if they were to provide because uh, uh, if we've got five hospitals, right? Yes. In the, and Tuolumne County, Sonora has one. Yes. If they were to do something with Tuolumne, I don't know. But how does the funding get split up? Because it's not an unlimited amount of funding. It, because they still use, utilize our hospitals, right? Yes. As a primary. So would we split the funding with Alpine and these other folks that, if they were to do their own uh, Mountain Valley 2.0. Do you know how it would be funded? So I, I I don't know exactly how it would be funded. I know for a joint powers authority and having a contract with the state of California, there is a specific funding model that you must follow to be a multi-county EMS agencies. Um, as far as funding specifically for Stanislaus County, um, the revenue that comes in for Stanislaus County is from those specialty centers, those hospitals as well as the um, ambulance providers and um, any type of uh, uh, education, any program type education, those type of uh, fees that are associated with that. Um, there would be no cost to those counties for utilizing hospitals within Stanislaus County. Um, those are based upon contracts between hospital to hospital to provide transport to those facilities. And so. Uh, cost associated, if we were a single county EMS agency, all the revenue would be driven from Stanislaus County. Um, if we were a JPA and, or correction, if we were contracting with the JPA or with those other counties, then the revenue would additionally come from those counties' support for providing oversight of their EMS system. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but. What, what is, sorry, just real quick to, to expand on that. And so 300,000 is what the county was. What's the total budget of Mountain Valley EMS? I don't know. I believe the total budget's okay. about 1.5 million, roughly, okay. Cindy. Yes. Okay. Made up of all those sources you just went through. Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry, we we get so used to this was gems and now it's bucks, and we look to yeah, yeah. and so we all have our expertise, and so now this is bucks expertise to to oversee with you guys. So yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, anyone in the audience, opportunity to speak on this item. Seeing none, bring it back to the board for action. It's accepting an update. Make a motion to accept staff recommendation. Okay, we have a motion. Second. We have a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. <sighs> 
So you wouldn't need two minutes? Or we can power through? It's up to you guys. I'm, whatever you I think we can go one at a time. Keep going. All right, keep going. Okay. We're moving on to item A3, approval of a locally preferred alignment for State Route 132, Dakota Avenue to Gates. Dave Lehman will be presenting. We do have one public comment. Good morning. <laughs> Good afternoon, actually, isn't it? Good afternoon. Chair Chiesa, board members, Assistant CEO Dietrich, and County Council Bose. Good afternoon. We're here to talk about adopting State Route 132. A recommendation for a locally Avenue preferred project Road alternative. Project uh, Caltrans has been working on the environmental document the for this project for about three years. Of the State Route 132, Dakota Avenue to Gates here. Road project. Oh, very nice. What is that? I don't know. It's like a delay. I think it's interesting. At um, any rate, why are we doing this project? This project would improve mobility through western Stanislaus County. Improve capacity for regional movement of traffic and goods. Improve the circulation of local roads and connectivity to State Route 132. Provide route continuity from Phase 1. And improve safety. Several rural driveways along the existing facility create conflict movements for mainline traffic. It greatly reduces um, head-on collisions. And so the here's a uh, general map. You can Dakota see uh, phase to one Road, to the project east between and location and Dakota. The project, which is in Stanislaw County, west of the city of Modesto, no, would be an extension like of the State really Route really 132 know. West Who Freeway Expressway project that is currently being built on a new alignment in the city of Modesto. Huh. The project proposes to build a new four-lane freeway or expressway along a new alignment. There's audio on the Oh, you know what? It's because I see it. Hold on. There we go. That's Caltrans. No wonder. So I stole their PowerPoint. Uh, it's still on. That is crazy. Hold on. Hold on. Let me kill the volume on this. There we go. All right. PG. Um, they're not as clever as me, but sometimes <laughs> they're, I'm not as clever as they are. So at any rate, I stole their PowerPoint and it was scripted. Sorry about that. I didn't even see that. Um, at any rate, um, back to, so we are at phase one of 132 and to the east and that connects 99 to Dakota. And then this project um, plans on connecting Dakota to Gates. And there are four alternatives that uh, Caltrans considered, and Caltrans has uh, been working on the environmental document on this. And uh, alternatives one and two utilize the um, 1950s and 1960s uh, right of way that was purchased. And alternative three builds to the north of existing Mays Boulevard, and alternative four builds to the south of existing Mays Boulevard. And here's what the cross section is proposed to look like. Uh, it's a four lane expressway freeway, uh, 30 foot uh, median in the middle, um, two 12 foot lanes, um, larger shoulders, and a controlled uh, access uh, right away. And so the alternative one, the expressway, um, no connection to Dakota, um, and then it would have um, it would have intersections at Hart and Butler and Gates. And um, these would all be at grade. Alternative two is much more like a freeway. Uh, again, no, um, no connection to Dakota. It would be either overcrossing or undercrossing. I'd have an interchange at Hart um, with two roundabouts or signals um, controlling the off ramps and on ramps an interchange uh, just to the east of Gates, and that would have um, two roundabouts or signals uh, controlling the off-ramps and on-ramps, and we'll see a detail of that. And then it would go on to um, uh, existing maze west of, uh, of Gates. And so here's what the interchange might look like, um, what we've studied. And um, what it does for uh, local traffic is it makes it harder to get onto Paradise, and it makes it harder to get onto to Gates, which is a good thing for the residents out there. 
Um, we want people to use this new uh, access control facility. And if you aren't really consciously making a decision about trying to get to Paradise or Gates, you're just going to follow everybody else. You're going to zip right into downtown Modesto on this alignment. Um, one of the things we're worried about with the other three alternatives is it's a lot easier to peel off and use uh, either Paradise or Gates on the other three alternatives. Alternative three builds a uh, new uh, expressway to the north of existing maze. It would take out the Chevron, some houses, and other things along, along Maze Boulevard. And alternative four does the same thing on the south side, takes out Twin Rivers, a mobile home park, and uh, other things. Um, both alternatives three and four have more impacts to um, housing and businesses. Um, you always study a no-build alternative in an environmental document, and that doesn't meet the purpose and need of our project, so we're not a real big fan of that one. And so the, the um, project construction and cost, um, somewhere between $116 million and $183 million uh, in current dollars. Uh, we think it'd take a couple years to build. Um, we think it could happen as soon as 2025, depending on funding. And uh, some of the funding uh, measures or um, sources we have right now, um, there is uh, some Measure L on this project. It's $28 million in 2019 dollars. So it is more than 28 right now. Um, PFFR TIF, we're going to collect uh, $46 million for this phase in the next 20 years. Um, it is eligible for STIP dollars. And um, SB1 trade corridor, and federal transportation project uh, programs. One of the things that we just heard from CTC this month is it's now a priority uh, ITIP route, which is good news because Caltrans might throw some of their uh, regional money on this project too. So there is some acknowledgement from Caltrans and CTC that this is a priority project in Northern California, which is good news. And so here's the, uh, some of the things that we've done for public involvement for the draft environmental impact report. Um, the no notice of preparation went out in September of 18. Public scoping meeting was held in October of 18. Prior to the pandemic, those were in person. <coughs> um, we did do a virtual public meeting um, with project updates um, back in, I think, sorry, the year's wrong. That was October 7, 2020. Um, the DEIR uh, was released for public review and a uh, virtual public hearing was held on May 22nd. Caltrans hosted that and the comment period is now closed. The findings of the draft environmental report. Um, all four alignment alternatives are viable alternatives. The key differences are uh, farmland, visual, right-of-way impacts and noise. And the key differences for the engineering studies are traffic operations and project costs. Alternative three is, and four, as I said, has the greatest impacts to homes and businesses. Alternative four impacts the mobile home park. Alternatives one and two uh, require acquisition of the least number of parcels. And all these have um, large footprints. Um, alternatives one, three, and four have the smallest footprint and result in less impacts to farmlands. Alternative alignments three and four are the most disruptive to existing homes in the community. Alternatives two and three have the highest costs. Alternative two has the greatest improvement in traffic operations with the least impact to homes and businesses, businesses and keeps people on the new facility. Therefore, staff <laughs> recommends uh, alternative two and it keeps uh, traffic off of Paradise and Gates. And so we'll, we'll stop for questions, but staff recommends that um, we adopt and recommend to Caltrans a locally preferred alternative uh, for State Route 132, Dakota to Gates. It, and I know there's a reason we study all of them, but this was pretty apparent early on. Although the you know the cost is not the cheapest, but it sure seemed like it was the was going to be the preferred choice. I, I feel sometimes it, and. Um, without Caltrans being here, I suppose it's easier to say. They, they were, on, on phase one, they didn't like us dropping Alt-5, which was uh, studying existing Mace Boulevard through Modesto, and it would have wiped out two blocks, and the neighborhood was upset because we didn't uh, 
fully evaluate alternative five. And so I think that's really why Caltrans picked three and four to study, because it showed everyone what truly what the impacts are. And so um, it, that's why they, we carried alts three and four all the way through. And then one last editorial comment. So phase one is just about completed, mm -hmm. City of Modesto, which is two lanes. Phase two is going to four lanes on the same utility. Mm -hmm. And then phase three is what we're talking about right here. And phase two doesn't work without phase three. That's right. Uh, editorial comment is that it needs to be done together. I know that we're not on exactly the same timeline, but we need to be on exactly the same timeline when we start to build. So just a thought. <laughs> That's perfect. That's just, yeah, just what I was going to say. No. We can't let three or two happen without three being completed because it'll, it'll be a cluster right there at Dakota. So, yeah, so we know that. And, Dave, I just want to thank you so much for the, all that you're doing on this and how hard you've been working on this. As soon as we got phase one going, it started, you know, which took us, uh, seems like a lifetime to get literally 60 years um, in the making, this whole thing. I know that um, and very much appreciate you jumping on the next, you know, the phase three and uh, to, to get it to the next, to Gates Road. And, and, and that's just critical. That has to happen to make this, um, to make this thing really work. Alternative two, like, like we say, it is great. That's the one we've got to go with. Of course, it's the most expensive. That just seems to be the way it is. But it's going to be the best product when we're all done with that. Um, I know it talks about farmland and using the most farmland, but but if you could tell us, again, this is 60 years in the making. The majority of that farmland has been owned by the state of California for at least probably for 60 years. Is that right? That, from, that is from Dakota to Gates. That is correct. Uh, we own about 65 to 70 percent of the the right of way necessary for all two. So most of that land we already we own at least a majority of it so right um, and we are working closely with Stan Cog and, and the Cog knows that um, we have to do two and three together right uh, there is some technical reasons why they have to be just disjointed by at least a day but it's um, we we know that it's important to the citizens and uh, it's something that we're just gonna have to figure out we're working yeah. on them with them every day so yeah that's great and so when we talk about <clears throat> from the farmland standpoint the people who own or who are farming on that land right now are renting that farmland from the state of California and have been for 50 or 60 years and have known this day was coming so it's not something that's a surprise to anybody for that to happen though we, we always want to preserve our farmland and protect it in this county this is something that has been in the works for a long time. It's great, like you said, on alternative two also that to keep traffic off of um, as much as we can and get it to stay on 132 and keep it off of gates and keep it off of paradise. You know, I live over off of paradise and it's just, it's, it's, it's a road that's not built for the 70 mile an hour traffic that's happening. It's skinny. I can remember a few years back, a, a little boy playing in his front yard on, on paradise was killed as a car trying to pass, uh, you know, through there. And I see the house every day, and it reminds me of, of the kid. It's just, it's not made for that traffic. And so this will help relieve that, which will be great. So we look forward to it. And I just think, you know, the, this 2025 would be great if we can get this going by then. It's, it's great how fast we're moving so far with phase one. And like Vito said, by the end of the year, we'll have this. I Sunday, a couple days ago, my wife and I are heading to St. Stan's for church at 9 o'clock and turning off of Grimes onto 132, heading heading west, and, and if it hadn't been for my wife, I, I'm looking left for the cars coming, and as I turn back right, here comes a car right in our mm -hmm. face, passing double line right through that intersection, and, um, and we were able to get off you know, into the dirt to avoid it at the last second, but um, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that's gonna go away and the lives that are gonna be saved because of this. So anyway, just very proud of the hard work you guys have been doing on this, and we will find the, the additional money we need to finish this thing up. Um, it looks like we've got about half of it, at least half of it in the works um, to finish this this phase out the gate. So thank you very much. I very much support this. I did want to make sure that we uh, shouted out Caltrans because nobody else could have done this in the amount of time they did. The Caltrans has done an excellent job on the environmental document. So they're on time and on budget, which is a lot of fun to say for our partners at Caltrans. So good job, Caltrans. Good channel. Thank, thank you. Job. Thank for you. Me. Any other comments? All right, anyone in the public? Okay. Come on up. Well, we all know that State Route 132 
definitely needs to be worked on. And we had another fatality out there just last week. And it's just, it's over capacity. People get impatient, they'll do stupid things. And as you, what happened to you, Mr. Withrow, is you were coming out of the church on Sunday. You know, you and your wife were fortunate, but that family last week wasn't so fortunate. So it's clear we have to do something. But I guess the only thing I was looking at when I was looking at the alternative two is there was a mention of roundabouts um, as part of the interchange. And the document I have here wasn't, wasn't as detailed as that gentleman's presentation. Um, David, you're going to have to listen to this because you're <laughs> we're clarifying something in the motion. I just wanted to get a clarification here. Um, on the roundabouts, because roundabouts are a touchy issue. That roundabout on Tracy, as you come into Tracy on um, West 11th Avenue, can be a white knuckler to go through. So do you have a preference, or does your staff preference have, um, instead of using roundabouts versus um, uh, traffic signals to control those two intersections, what would be your preference to use at this point? The, the engineers, we like roundabouts because they reduce speed mm -hmm. and they reduce severity of collisions. So roundabouts, although the county doesn't have a single roundabout yet, and we're still looking for our first roundabout application, we do like roundabouts. So, and it was surprising in Slida last week, the Slida Mac um, recommended that we do a couple temporary roundabouts in Slida, which they've not been supportive of roundabouts in the past. And so I think people are getting a little more used to them than before. So the engineers, we like roundabouts. Sometimes the public likes signals better, but what we've seen like at Crow's Landing in West Maine, the little community out there, they would have now prefer a roundabout because people speed 60, 65 miles an hour to try to hit a green light or a yellow, mm -hmm. where if it was a roundabout, you have to at least slow down to 25. And so engineers prefer roundabouts. But what I said in the PowerPoint is, I think we, if, if people really preferred signals in that neighborhood, we could, we could study the signals and replace the roundabouts with signals it's not set in stone, but it's one of those things where we're recommending roundabouts at the, at the ramps. Okay, now, because um, I know the, the roundabout in Tracy is a two-lane roundabout, mm -hmm. which really, if you have someone not paying attention, you get crossovers and it can be pretty hairy going through that. These two roundabouts, would they likely be to be um, single-lane or two-lane roundabouts? They would be single-lane. All right, that's a lot easier to deal with. So not quite as crazy on that. Anyway, that was my comment. And the fact that, yeah, we got to do something on 132 before we lose another family out there. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. OK, anyone else? Seeing none, bring it back to the board. OK, I am going to make a motion, but I think Tom wants to. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not real happy with the staff recommendation. I want to change it to approval to recommend to Caltrans the locally preferred alignment alternative two for the State Route 132 Dakota Avenue to Gates Road project. It sounds like he just called you out. He did. No, that's okay. I, I don't know. I just, I like adopt, but we're not supposed to adopt because it's not our facility. So please strike the yes. adopt and rec and adopt and rec and get rid of those two words. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. We do have a motion. Did we get a second? Second. We have a second motion and a second. All right. All those in favor of not adopting. Approving. Right. Approving. Approving. Uh, and now strike that from this recommendation. Alternative two for State Route 132, decoded Gates Project. Say aye. 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 First and the second. Very Thank good. You Thank you. Motion carries 5 0. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you for humoring me. <laughs> yep, no, that's good. a good catch. Acceptance of a report on progress and accounting for the use of Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act Coronavirus Relief Fund Allocation, approval of an additional $1 million uh, for nonprofit support. And um, Raul's, Raul, are you starting on this? Angelica? I'll be starting on this. All right. Bringing up our PowerPoint here. No problem. Just Take your time. And I do have one letter I think we just received it this morning. So, uh, well, public comment. <laughs> I was ready to say good morning, 
but it is 12.20 in the afternoon. Thank you for hanging out with us. We'll try to do this quickly and leave enough time for your question. Um, so good afternoon, members of the board, uh, County Council Bowes, and Assistant uh, CEO, Assistant Executive Officer uh, Patrice Dijon. My name is Angelica Ramos, and I'm joined by our Assistant Auditor Controller, uh, Jin Uyang. And we will also be hearing from Raul Mendez closer to the end of the presentation. And we are here to provide you an update on our current um, spending and cleaning for coronavirus aid relief and economic security act crf funds so as we have background on march 4th 2020 the governor issued the proclamation um, of a state of emergency in california related to the uh, 2019 novel coronavirus pandemic and then the board adopted um, a local resolution uh, ratifying the declaration of that local health emergency on March 17, 2020. Uh, on June 9th of 2020, the Board of Supervisors uh, approved policy recommendations for the use of some coronavirus um, CARES Act um, coronavirus relief funds that had been received from the Department of the Treasury of $96.1 million. Um, we also received $12.8 million in state pass-through um, CARES Act CRF funds uh, from the state of California, totaling our amount uh, of funding available to respond to the coronavirus at $108.9 million. Since then, we've earned some interest on the funds. So total available, available funds as of today are $109.7 million, and you'll hear a little more detail about that later on in the presentation. Originally, the funds were scheduled to expire on December 30th, 2020, but the federal government passed a Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 on December 27th, 2020, and extended use of the funds through December 31st of 2021. So on your screen, I'd like to describe what's included in uh, two different categories, um, the first being the category of county department support. So I'll go through the little yellow box from top to bottom. Um, through June 4th of 2021 in the area of community depart county department support, um, the county has spent and claimed $42 million. Um, and then in the next row, acknowledges an, an additional $11 million has been allocated to departments through various budget cycles and board items um, through fiscal year 2021 for use in responding to the, to the pandemic. Um, departments also in that next row show uh, about $700,000 um, through June 4th uh, that was um, obligated or encumbered for um, upcoming invoices they expected to receive um, in, those, in that uh, response. This leaves in this pot of money $6 million um, available in a county department reserve, um, which is available to continue to support response to the pandemic and the emergency operations center personnel, as well as department response costs. We will look to these funds to help fund any CRF supported requests um, that are received in future budget cycles. And this, uh, this funding is estimated to be sufficient to continue to support the county organization and claiming costs and responding to the pandemic through December 31st of 2021. Well, one portion of note, um, I asterisk the very top row there, um, 12 point, about 12.8 to $12.9 million um, of CRF funds, largely the state funds, um, were claimed using the presumptive eligible cost category. And this created general fund savings for us for what would have otherwise been a general fund cost. Um, we've taken that savings at year end and we've set it aside in the general fund um, in a reserve uh, for future use to continue to respond to the pandemic. But between that uh, 12.8 to 12.9 million and the 6 million that is there on the bottom row there of the yellow box um, that's in reserve, we have that available to continue to respond to the emergency. And so a little clarification on presumptive eligible. Per guidance issued by the US Department of Treasury, presumptive eligible costs are defined as those that result from first responder activities in response to the pandemic. Specifically, 
the local government may presume that public health and public safety employees meet the sub substantially dedicated test. Um, only, um, this means that if the, presumptive, the pre if the presumption applies, then the work that's performed by such employees is considered to be substantially different in use um, than accounted for in the most recently approved budget back before we receive the funds on March 27, 2020. So all costs of such employees may be covered using payments from CRF for services provided during the period that begins March 1st, 2020 through the end of December, uh, uh, December 31st of 2021. Um, so going to the other side of this, there were $50 million that the boards uh, allocated um, and approved for community support. Um, in this category, I'll go through again that yellow box. Um, we have $15 million, um, which the board dedicated to the county's nine incorporated cities back last year when we first received the funding in order to assist them in responding to COVID. Um, and that funding has been distributed and spent by the cities. For business grants, this board approved two rounds of funding. Initially, $3 million uh, was part of an original business grant program. Once we received the funds, we CRF funds, we, uh, this board approved an additional $15.4 million uh, for small business revitalization uh, for a total of $18.4 million. In the next category, labeled nonprofit organizational support, $5.4 million is split, split between um, different initiatives. So approximately $3 million uh, is being used to partner with local community-based organizations to provide direct services to assist uh, to assist members of the public in responding um, to COVID-19. Uh, for nonprofit organization support, the county's partnered with five community-based organizations to provide public health outreach, education, and wraparound services to COVID-19 impacted individuals. The other $2.4 million was used to create a nonprofit support competitive grant program administered by the Stanislaw Community Foundation to offer relief to nonprofit organizations providing services to youth or in the area of community center, centered arts and culture impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. In the next row, $2 million is dedicated to the Stan Rad program. Um, this was initiated through an agreement with Downtown Modesto Partnership, who's assisting with the administration of the program for a touchless gift card program. Um, $550,000 in the next row is set aside for administrative costs from various entities that are assisting with administering uh, these programs and these CRF funds. Up to $500,000 in the next row was approved in the plan for financial assistance to fire districts and the unincorporated area. And that leaves a remaining $8.2 million as the balance established in a community support reserve, which uh, takes, brings us to that total of $15, $50 million and is available for more um, for use in additional community support initiatives. So at this time, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to our assistant county auditor and uh, Jin, Jin Yang, and he's gonna take us through some detail on actuals. Um, thank you, Angelica. So uh, to date, the county has received all $108.9 million of both the federal and the state allocation. Um, and as uh, Angelica mentioned, the federal allocation earned $741,000 in interest income and the state allocation earned $47,000 in interest. Next slide, please. On this next slide, we're um, <clears throat> looking at the total FEMA and the CRF costs incurred um, through June 4th, uh, 2021. So estimated uh, FEMA eligible costs as of um, June 4th, 2021 is 4.1 million. Um, and we have uh, we have determined that the eligible cost uh, amount for reimbursement, reimbursement is at 4.1 million. Um, previously, at the start of the pandemic, FEMA agreed to reimburse um, only 75% of the total cost. Um, and the county would have used 20, uh, CRF over the 25% match 
So uh, on February 3rd, 2021, the president issued a directive to allow FEMA to pay 100% of all eligible costs from the beginning of the pandemic from January 2020 to September 30th of 2021. So we retroactively went back and claimed all eligible uh, FEMA costs at 100%. And we then uh, took back $663,000 of CRF for um, CRF uses. So the timing of the FEMA reimburse, re reimbursement is unknown and it's really contingent on FEMA reviews and claims and resolve any questions related to the claim. All, my office have gone back and forth with FEMA um, on um, our first claim, which was filed, submitted on October 22nd, 2020. And so we're still going back and forth with them on, on some of those issues. On the next slide, <clears throat> we just want to recap um, what our um, t total emergency costs incurred and obligated as of June 4th, 2021. Um, so our total incur as of fiscal year, um, I should, shouldn't say fiscal year, but total incur as of June 4th, um, it's 83.1 million, but our total claim is 82.1 million. And that difference in the million dollars is really due to timing. We did have some expenses come in from um, county departments that after we submitted our claim, which was July 12th. And so we will include our, that $1 million in our future, um, in our next cycle. Um, so 13.4 million is obligated but not spent and so largely um, due to $11.7 million unspent for department uh, costs, about $1.3 million unspent for CBOs. Um, and the, so the total incurred and obligated um, as of June 4th is $95.5 million. Um, and then the total available funds to spend is $14.1 million, um, $6 million from our department support and then on, a, on the next slide, we will have we will show another 8.1 million in community reserve support reserve. Sorry. And so, as I know, I mentioned, we did um, transfer uh, on the next bucket. Uh, next um, bucket there. Sorry, we could go back on the next slide. Um, we did give out $15 million to the, the uh, nine in, in no incorporated cities, and all cities have submitted their claims since 2021. Um, and then $18.4 million was transferred to Valley First Union for distribution to 673 small businesses. Um, $57,000 was not dispersed and was returned to the county. And as for nonprofits, um, we, we allocated $2.4 million or $5.4 million to nonprofits. Um, so far, $892,000 has been spent on PPE for nonprofit support programs. $1.1 million has been obligated for community based organizations, direct support services, and then $2.4 million has been spent for nonprofit youth based programs. On this, and then two million um, has been spent on the Stanrad um, car program. Five hundred and fifty thousand dollars was allocated to um, our administration of grants. Um, this includes two hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars of payroll costs that's been um, <coughs> expended, ninety thousand dollars for contracts, and fourteen thousand dollars for marketing costs uh, for business grant program. And we also allocated $500,000 to the fire districts. So far, $353,000 have been spent by the district and $147,000 has been obligated as of June 4th. And we have $8.1 million um, that's been earmarked as community support reserve and is currently on the side.
invite Raul up to talk to talk to us through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Angelica. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, so wanted to uh, bring um, this conversation back to the board uh, as a way of background. Uh, in late 2020, uh, the Board of Supervisors did approve $2.4 million towards a nonprofit support competitive grant program. Uh, this was administered by the uh, Santa Claus Community Foundation, provided relief to nonprofit organizations that provided services to uh, those uh, youth and also in the area of community center arts and culture. Uh, a total of 61 local organizations received funding based on the grant application and the approved scoring rubric. Um, in 2020, the San Jose Community Foundation also administered a report concluding that the pandemic had indeed increased the demand for nonprofit services while diminishing revenue streams uh, from public sources, private donors, and larger uh, philanthropic uh, foundations. Uh, further, that this resulted in widespread need for general operating support and that flexible funding would allow these nonprofits, local nonprofits, to continue to support our community. Uh, given the widespread uh, need and critical role that nonprofit organizations play in Santa Cruz County, uh, your staff is proposing that we um, that you consider allocating an additional million dollars of funding to this program. Uh, funding uh, would be prioritized uh, for those uh, organizations that have not yet received funding through the prior cycles, uh, and also expanding it or opening it up to other critical services such as those uh, for our seniors and our youth. I'm sorry, our seniors and our veterans. Uh, for simplicity and ease, we are recommending that we continue the uh, relationship with the San Jose Community Foundation to administer the program. Uh, the cost for their support uh, during this next cycle is $20,000. Uh, the Community Foundation, as uh, the board is well aware, has the uh, portal, the structure already in place to be able to um, deliver this next round of funding uh, very swiftly, and hence why we're, we're providing that recommendation. Uh, the Community Foundation will also, uh, like they have in past cycles, provide technical support and training to those local nonprofits that want to participate in, in this uh, next funding cycle. Uh, from our experience during the last um, rounds of funding, um, they, have very good, um, they have very good channels of communication with our local nonprofits and have an easy way of bringing them together to share information. And that would be our, our expectation through their administrative support in this case as well. Uh, so essentially, uh, assisting nonprofit organizations through the entire application process uh, from beginning to submission. Uh, in summary, the grant program as we are presenting it today has several key components. Uh, the applicant must be a 501c3 providing services in Stanislaus County. In working with the Community Foundation, we have developed four tiers uh, that will be established to recognize priorities. Uh, tier one uh, would be focused on senior and veteran serving nonprofits that did not receive funding in 2020. Uh, tier two would be eligible nonprofits that did not receive funding in 2020 and primarily serve communities of color, low income, rural, ge geographically isolated, or other historically underserved populations of the county. Uh, tier three would include uh, eligible nonprofits that did not receive funding in 2020 and primarily serve the general population. Uh, tier four would be eligible, eligible nonprofits that received funding in, in 2020. So in summary, that's uh, the way we are proposing to uh, develop the tiers for this next uh, round of funding. Organizations will be required to submit uh, the most recently filed IRS Form 990. Uh, prior year audited or unaudited financial statements and their current year's operating budget and a one-page list of support received through other sources. If the nonprofit is a new nonprofit, uh, we will be uh, asking them to submit, uh, submit their pro forma operations plan, their annual budget forecast, and the first three years of operations and proof of funds raised from other sources. Grant requests and awards uh, may not exceed 10% of the nonprofit annual budget, another element of the program for this funding cycle. Uh, grant awards uh, for new nonprofits will be uh, maxed at $50,000 per entity. Uh, we anticipate this application period to run from October 5th through the 26th, and then grant, grant award recommendations will be considered by your board uh, back in November or in mid-November. That's, that's our expectation. 
I understand that uh, we have received some public comments in regards to some suggestions that we may want to consider. So I wanted to try and address those in, in my comments in, in the presentation here. Uh, one of the requests was to consider uh, um, allocating more funding than the million dollars as being recommended. Uh, as this board is aware, uh, we certainly have an opportunity to revisit that when we bring uh, the recommendations back, back to this board. Uh, essentially, that's what we did last time. If you recall, the board initially um, approved $2 million for the program. We later were able to allocate $400,000 of additional funding based on the need that was determined through, through our uh, application process. Um, technical support will be provided, as uh, previously mentioned, to any applicant or any interested nonprofit. Uh, I want to make sure that that's clear. Uh, the Stanislaus Community Foundation, through the agreement, uh, for administrative support, that's one of the requirements. Uh, as, as indicated, they do have a robust um, way of doing that, uh, connecting with the local nonprofits, basically either providing them uh, training as a whole group uh, or working with individual nonprofits on a case-by-case -case basis. There was also a suggestion that we also include a uh, racial equity, social justice component to our tier system. This is something we're open to. Uh, I believe it would be appropriate to consider adding that element to Tier 2. It appears to be um, uh, a place where we can address that, that comment. Uh, the last comment, I, think, I believe, had to do with non-competitive contracting. Uh, I think during our current process, uh, it's already set up to bring in nonprofits and provide funding in a very simple way. I think this comment, uh, and we can clarify with uh, the individual that submitted it, I, I think it um, was uh, focused on trying to make it easy for nonprofits to participate in this program, trying to make it easy for them to receive funds so that they're able to provide services uh, in a timely manner to our, to our community. And so we'd be open to having those conversations. I think our current pro program already has that, but certainly open to uh, making modifications, working with the Stanislaus Community Foundation uh, to uh, consider those, those suggestions. There are two staff recommendations before you this more, this afternoon, excuse me, uh, as displayed there on the screen. Uh, the first uh, recommendation is to accept the report on progress and accounting for the use of uh, Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act Coronavirus Relief Fund allocations for the period ended June 4th, 2021. And then your second recommendation is to approve a, uh, an additional million dollars uh, our funding cycle for the nonprofit support grant program as uh, part of the uh, business revitalization and economic development strategy, detailed and recommended in your staff report. We are all available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, questions? Mr. Just real, quick. Yeah. real quick, Raul, yes. so just to make sure. So we've got the 8.189. Um, reserve that we're talking about still for community support and um, but really we've got 9.891 if we because we haven't spent some of this other um, we've still got a little bit of business grant and then some other COVID support for nonprofits so do we really have nine sorry in Helicott whoever yeah yeah so, so that uh, it does room some of the areas that have been allocated funds in the past for community support have not demonstrated full spending so we do okay. have um, that additional almost takes us up to almost $9.9 million right. in that whole category that has not yet been okay. spent. And, and it seems like probably the nonprofit COVID support, that's probably not going to get spent. I'm sure their nonprofits aren't looking for that support probably anymore, whether it was for, um, you know, the, the PPE or whatever. Well, yeah. Um, so but, I did follow up on that just to um, address any kind of a timing issue that may be happening with that. Cause some of our yeah. claiming cycles get a little bit away from when we're actually incurring the expenditures. Okay. And it is my understanding that we set up, um, we did set up a payable based on information that we had that was close between six and seven hundred thousand dollars of that to take us through the balance of okay. last fiscal year. So I do anticipate they will tap into that um, 1.3 million dollars that you see in the table in the staff report that's to, still available. Okay, to the extent of six hundred thousand, you think maybe in the six rest to seven hundred thousand was okay. the information that I had last. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious why somebody wouldn't have claimed that at this point if they and then it's still sitting there. So they may have invoiced us, but our claiming cycles are a few months in between. So it just depends on when the staff um, are able to 
um, gather all of the appropriate backup to include on a claim. Okay. So potentially, um, really we're talking about $9 million here. If those came through, maybe $9 million available. Yes. And, and we're just talking about $1 million right now for this, Correct. this um, mm -hmm. increase. And, and the deadline again for, for um, spending this is, is December 31, 2021? That is correct. Or is it 2022? 2021. Okay. This year. Okay, so this $9 million has to be spent in the next four months here. Three yes. Months, yeah, three and a half months. Yeah. Okay. And again, this is money specifically. We're not talking about our, our costs, county costs. This is money that we'd put aside for um, community support. Correct. Okay. So I'm just thinking time-wise. So we come back here after, so we go through this process for the million dollars to give to everybody. And the, sorry, Patrice, I should have been looking over at you too. Yeah. <laughs> that, that we, um, and we'll come back here then with some recommendations. It sounds like it's going to go through the end of October. Um, before that'll happen, and then we'll be back here and say, okay, here's where the million should be spent, and we we'll still could potentially have eight million we need to spend before or lose, right, or have to return. Or uh, this isn't money that we can sure. show. Um, presumptive eligible. Yeah. Presumptive eligible. Presumptive can eligible. we? We can. We yeah. can. And in fact, that's that is our plan: is to look to whatever is still in balance on both the county department support and the community support side. But to utilize presumptive eligible. Don't we still have like 11 or $12 million that we're saying right now is presumptive eligible sitting there? We do. Okay, so we're just, it's, this is a lot of money that we really need to get out. It sounds like we're gonna have to get out. And so if, so if you have the 11 or so million from um, county support and then we've got community support, maybe another 8 million after if we came back here. So, um, I mean, we're talking almost $20 million that we're gonna have to, somehow figure out or that will fall into that presumptive eligible um, and we would reserve in a general fund reserve for continued support of the pandemic yeah. or the ways that this board okay I, I would just like to see us get this I mean, as we're it's great we're going out with a million dollars is just really get aggressive and figure out how to spend the, the remaining of this money that we had dedicated as community support mm -hmm. get the additional um, eight million dollars which is what it sounds like it'll be after this million out into the community and so, um, and not be a fire drill at the end or having to say that it's presumptively, presumptively eligible, you know, you know, because we, the community needs it, right? This is their tax dollars we're trying to get back to them. So, so for what that's worth, um, a tough problem to have, right? I mean, this is amazing that yeah. we're, we're trying to figure these things out. So, I don't know, just any Could, other thoughts? Yeah, and, and Supervisor, we have had discussions at the staff level about other um, proposals that we may bring to you here in the near future. Um, you know, this one in regards to the nonprofit support grant program was the one that was ready. Uh, I, I fully intend uh, our team to bring back uh, other proposals as, as we can here in the upcoming uh, weeks, hopefully. Uh, if not months, but uh, certainly hear your comment. There is uh, an opportunity to, um, you know, direct these funds to specific purposes as we go forward. Yeah, I think the last time, so we added money because there was enough need in the community. We added money to take care of that issue. Uh, I would be surprised if we could put three million. I know that we had that request, and have it spent by the end of the year based on the first go around because those people aren't eligible. This go around, so the grouping becomes smaller, and uh, providing technical assistance and trying to get them to a 501c3 isn't going to be done before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So the presumptive eligible, the benefit of that is that if we open up back to the folks that were already um, awarded and or a breath, uh, a, a different breath, it allows us to fund them a longer period, maybe maybe another six months after the first year. It's just a thought process, mm -hmm. and I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not speaking based on any knowledge, just so you know. And, and let me just, uh, while I'm here, uh, know, uh, Noe Paramo from the California Rural Legal Assistance. You address most of this, uh, Raul, but uh, he was talking about new and emerging CBOs along with small, medium, and large, uh, making sure that the size, there's a size provided um, for different size uh, community-based organization that provide resources to the underserved, poor, rural, isolated communities of color and essential workers, and putting in that social justice uh, in the granting process. So I think, uh, you know, I, I would tell you that the community-based organizations serve largely those same folks that we're referring to. It doesn't bother me at all if we want to add the uh, social justice component, because I think that's right in the bailiwick, and I, I, I would imagine the community foundation 
can do that very easily. And I don't yes. know how much that, again, that, I'll leave that up to the, uh, the, the smarter folks, but, but I'm okay with that. And I, I do agree with the premise of what Supervisor Withrow talked about, knowing we have a backup plan, but again, bringing those other ones to us sooner rather than later so that we're not scrambling at the end of the year. And do, does the money have to be spent by that time or can it just be allocated? So it, it's supposed to be spent. Yeah, it's supposed to be spent. So that, that's why the backup plan is that we're not giving money back it, because you can run it through presumptive eligible. And there's, there's a whole host of things we can do with it. But uh, yeah. I guess the question would be if it's presumptive eligible and you pull it back out of presumptive eligible, do you have the chance of losing it then to use it somewhere else? No. So the presumptive eligible is essentially paying back for the cost of, uh, you know, lessened police services because, or we don't have fire ambulance, but in the police department, uh, sheriff's department, they're getting to fewer calls. They have to put on PPE, gloves, everything, and there's a the possibility of running that money through. That's what the cities did with generally their 15 million that we gave them. It was to help. So once it becomes general fund, when we claim presumptive eligible, it's general fund. Okay. And it's treated as general fund going forward. Okay, but we still keep track of it. Yeah, yes. but we're not, our intent is not to put it into the general fund right. as a whole. That's why it's in a separate account to spend in the community for the community. Any other thoughts, questions? Patrice, did you want to add something? Patrice, please. Yes, I was just going to add that the original $12.8 million that we did use presumptive eligible claiming on is established in the general fund, as Angelica said, in an assignment, and it is specifically labeled um, with its own designation so that it can be transparently viewed, and it would be our plan to do that with any additional presumptive eligible funds, which would be coming back to the board. We could report to you from which pot you know it had originally come from if you want to hold on to that. Um, that history, or you could look at it in, um, in, in a new way to do those things that you think would benefit the community and the organization. Every <laughs> time I go through the reserve report, that that little cutout winks at me and <laughs> <laughs> says, I'm here. So, all right, seeing no one else, let's open up to the public. Anyone from the public wish to speak? All right, bring it back. Uh, thoughts on adding the, uh, or giving direction on the social justice uh, scoring. I, I don't know that it will have a profound effect, but is that something that, no thoughts? All right, I guess I'm gonna turn it over to you guys for comments and or motion. I will make a motion to accept staff recommendations. Second that motion. And that's without any change, just on staffs, okay. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you much. Oh. Down to the final item. Acceptance of an update on the Stanislaus Emergency Rental Assistance Program and authorized participation in the State Rental Assistance Program. We have Tina Rocha and Barbara from the Housing Authority. Thanks. Nice to see you, Barbara. Super cool mask. I need just two seconds. No problem. Barbara, when you speak, drag that mic over in front of you or else no one will hear you. Perfect. There we go. All right. Okay. Here we go. Good afternoon, um, Chairman, Board. Um, County Council Bowes and Assistant Executive Officer Dietrich. Um, Tina Rocha, Deputy Executive Officer, Stanislaus County Chief Executive Office, and with me today is Barbara Kaus, the Chief Executive Officer for the Stanislaus Regional Housing Authority, who likes tie-dye masks that we heard. <laughs> 
Um, so I'm going to run through the background very quickly here um, just to ground us all. So we're here to provide an update on the Stanislaus Emergency Rental Assistance Program and then also ask for authorization to participate in the State Rental Assistance Program. So if you'll recall, um, back in December, Congress had passed um, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which allocated funding to an emergency rental assistance program. Um, there were two ways to receive these funds. The first one was for jurisdictions over 200,000 in population, which the county falls into that category. So we received a direct allocation from the U.S. Treasury. The other way was um, funds were distributed to the states, and the state of California also reserved some funds on behalf of Stanislaus County um, because we were a population over 200,000. So on the screen, you can see that our federal allocation was around $10 million, and our state reservation was about $10.7 million. Um, original expenditure deadlines for those were um, December 31st for our federal allocation and the state's reservation was September 30th of this year. Those have since been extended and so our federal allocation is now through September 30th of 2022 as is the state reservation. Tina, I yes. noticed that on our slides, the printed out slides here, yes. it says December 31st. You're right. So it is actually September 30th. There was a typo on there. Um, so yes, thank you, County Council. I was going to point that out at the end, but good point right there. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's why you're there. Um, so on the eligibility side, again, high level. Um, these were for, quote, eligible households that had an income at or below 80% of the area median income. They would qualify for unemployment or had experienced a reduction in household income or incurred costs related to COVID and were demonstrating risk of um, homelessness or housing instability. Um, the prioritization was for those households that were, um, had been unemployed for the 90 days prior to application and then had the income at or below 50% of the area median income. And that chart at the, at the bottom of the um, screen will show you what those um, amounts are. So for a family of four, um, for 50% or below, or 50% of the area median income, that means a family of four was not making any more than 35650 a year, just for perspective on the households that we're talking about. So I mentioned the state rental assistance program and that we had a reservation from the state. So in January, the state passed the COVID-19 Tenant Relief Act, and that not only extended the eviction moratorium protections that had already been in place um, through June 30th, it also established the state emergency rental assistance program. And while following federal guidelines, it also, um, it, it had a little, it went a little bit further and it was requiring landlords to waive 20% of arrears to receive 80% of the um, arrearage payment. And so um, we, had, um, we had three options at that point. Um, we could have the state administer both our local and federal um, our local allocation and our state reservation, but it would have needed to follow the state guidelines, again, requiring landlords to waive 20%. Um, we could have drawn down our state reservation and run it locally, again, under the state guidelines, or we could have chosen to self-administer our own local dollars and then had the state administer our reservation amount. So we had some um, community conversations um, and it confirmed what, what we had known. Um, we were very concerned about asking our local landlords to waive 20% of arrears. Um, we already have uh, not enough landlords um, running to these, proper, these, um, these households and we were very concerned that if we asked them to waive 20%, we were gonna drive away some of the landlords that we already do have and further deplete um, our inadequate housing rental supply. Um, also, community partners had shared with us that they were already having difficulty engaging with landlords, and they were, again, very concerned about asking any of our landlords to waive those 20% in arrears. So we had partnered with the city of Modesto, who also had received a direct allocation from the U.S. Treasury, um, to develop a local Stanislaus Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, we were all challenged at that time with capacity, um, responding to COVID, our existing organizations um, had all been impacted as well. 
And so we were looking for new opportunities. So we, we reached out to the Stanislaus Regional Housing Authority, our great partner sitting next to me here, um, who, who agreed to be our fiscal agent and program administrator for this. We also reached out to local credit unions, Rolling F, Modesto First Federal, Organized Labor, and Self-Help to partner with us in this opportunity and um, be intake centers, if you will, and assist um, households getting co uh, their applications completed. And then, of course, the United Way stepped up to assist us. So with our local guidelines and using our local federal dollars, we were able to pay 100% of rental arrears and utility arrears. We did not set a maximum per household because we wanted to make any household that was eligible 100% um, and whole. And then we focused again on the eligible households that were at 50% of AMI or below. And our local program um, was approved by the board and the city council on February 23rd, and it launched on February 24th. So now I'm going to turn this over to Barbara um, to talk, uh, share some of the details about our program. Um, thank you. One further clarification that we got from the state was if we did go with the state program, then we had to morph the federal program into the state guidelines. So even though the federal program allowed 100% if the state operated it at that time, they would only operate 80%. They since found out that um, landlords won't do that, and they've actually come to what we're doing, which, which is good because it makes a way for us to transition. In going over some of the numbers, we've received 7,120 applications. 603 of those were duplicates. So someone went into one credit union and applied, and then they went into another one and applied. So that means there were 6,517 um, 6, actual applications. Of those, we're processing 774. The reason why is because 2,649 applications in process are incomplete. What that means is people get to a certain point and they either think they're not eligible or for whatever reason they don't pro provide the documentation and they just stop with the process right there. Um, we also have 2,243 that are just non-responsive. They start an application, we're still required to process it, but they're um, non-responsive. So what we're doing now is going through and updating those, sending two notices saying, if you don't update your application, we'll consider it um, closed and denied because otherwise we have to go through this entire process that we've been going through with each and every application and it's not efficient. We've denied 589 um, applications of those process. That's a 69% denial rate. And I've been asked about that repeatedly. What we're finding is through media outlets, um, a lot of people just thought they didn't have to pay their rent during COVID. When they get to the point and they have to say, um, did you lose your job? No. Did your income change? No, it didn't change. Did, were you hospitalized? Did you have extra costs? No. Um, they just didn't pay their rent or they didn't pay their utilities and they're deemed ineligible. I have a lot of um, applications either denied or people who can't find housing receive a voucher because of no housing, but I've never seen this kind of denial rate. And it's simply because people thought they would get money to pay their rent and it has nothing to do with COVID. We've processed um, payments for 266 applications, which is approximately $1.7 million. Earlier, I just, for the record, um, it was requested information on the demographics <clears throat> of that 266. I can tell you that um, the highest percentage of people receiving funding are the Hispanic population with 43%. So going um, down the line just a little bit, <clears throat> some of the challenges that we've had with the program are there were no program guidelines, no template, no instructions. So basically the message was, we can't tell you how to do it, but don't mess up because then we'll, we'll fine you. Um, the guidance allowed self-certification, but please keep in mind that <clears throat> anybody that self-certified and they weren't honest on their application, the county and the city would be responsible for paying that funding back should there be an audit. So there was total fiscal responsibility. Um, this, there was no software initially uh, to work with us and help us process this application. We do have it now. We've been processing a lot faster. 
Um, it's had some bugs, but we're working um, through it. We also received strict warnings against fraud. We've actually had fraud cases that our general counsel has discussed with the um, county council and the city attorney's office. And again, any fraud that we process, um, even if we're not knowledgeable of it, we would be responsible to pay that money back. The other issue, the design of the program, it's based on tenants leaving <clears throat> a lot of our landlords frustrated because they can see if their tenants applied, but the tenants, once they find out that they're not getting the check, that the utilities um, companies are getting the checks, or the landlords are le have less motivation to um, go through the process. And then we have extensive federal um, reporting requirements. But in, thank you. <clears throat> but in spite of that, we continue to process um, the applications. Um, the national statistics for this funding going out was announced this last week, and it was 11% of the funding. We found that the challenges that we're having are nationwide. As a matter of fact, after this meeting, I have to return a call to Senator Feinstein's office because they need help in restructuring the program because they've had difficulty in getting the funds out. We're a little bit higher than the national average, but um, again, that, that just gives you some information. Due to the volume of the applications and also some pending deadlines, we've regrouped to um, figure out a way to process these applications faster. Again, I explained that the people who were non-responsive or had um, applications that they weren't giving documentations on, we are sending out notices to them, letting them know that they have a certain amount of time to do this or else we'll have to uh, deny their application so that we can keep going with the people who are eligible. The United Way will continue to assist callers. The City of Modesto will do data entry. Credit unions will assist applicants with completion of the applications. The County um, Community Services Agency will do eligibility processing and the Housing Authority will do compliance review and issue the, pay, um, the payments. This is particularly important because the Supreme Court just came out with the, the information saying that the, um, the national rent moratorium was not constitutional. That means the only rent moratorium that we have uh, expires September 30th, and even though we can expend the funds beyond that, the goal is to process and put hands on every application, and by um, going through and updating the list, so um, focusing on the people that did have COVID-related rental issues, uh, we're hoping to be able to process those by the end of September to avoid any evictions. Okay, thanks Barbara. Um, so on the state rental assistance program, um, the, the deadline was originally um, June 30th with the eviction moratorium and the payment of the rental arrears was limited to 80%. So in June, um, the state enacted um, Assembly Bill 832, which extended the tenant protections to September 30th, which Barbara just mentioned. And it also increased the rental arrears to 100%, which is matching our local program. So um, what, what we're asking today is originally, um, back in February, we had recommended going with option B, which would be we would run our own local program with our federal dollars under our guidelines, and then once that was exhausted, we would draw our state reservation funds down and run it under, run it under the state guidelines. Um, again, the reason for that was so we could use our funds at 100% for rental arrears, and then we would then draw our, our, our reservation and then go under the state guidelines at the 80%. With the change in the state guidelines to 100%, um, we would now be recommending the option C. Um, since our local program um, has oversubscribed at the moment, so we have received more requests than local funding we have, um, our recommendation would be to let the state administer the state reservation funds. Um, there are several reasons for that. One is that they've been able to scale up quicker um, for that magnitude. Secondly, when we started our local program, it was with the understanding that we would have all the funds expended within a much shorter time frame. 
And these programs are now, um, th well, the funds have now extended for a year, so they can now go out into September 2022. And so the program is just taking um, much longer. It's gotten much more complicated to administer. And it would also allow the Housing Authority staff to refocus its efforts on building more housing units in our community, which we all, um, we know we desperately need. So we see a lot of benefits at this time in um, leaving our reservation with the state and letting them administer it on our behalf. Um, here's just a quick timeline to show, um, you know, since December when that era round one um, funding was approved, um, in January is when the state came out um, saying that their reservation amounts would be limited to the 80%. We opened our program on February 24th. And then in June um, is when the state had gone back and amended that and now saying that their reservation amounts um, can pay for 100% of rental arrears. Um, this is just a quick funding overview. And again, this date has been corrected on this chart and was listed as December um, 31st, 2022 in the staff report. Um, so you'll see our federal one allocation um, is about 10 million. We are administering that locally and that expenditure deadline is now out a year. Um, but we absolutely do not think it's going to take that long to get all those funds into the community. Um, the state one era reservation for Stanislaus County is about 10.7 million. Um, again, that expenditure deadline is out to September 2022. And if the board approves it today um, with a memorandum of understanding, the state would administer that on our behalf. And then also with the ARPA funding, um, there was round two of the um, emergency rental assistance program, as you can see on the screen. So uh, once again, we received a direct allocation from the US Treasury of about 12.7 million. And then we also have a reservation from the state of about 9.5 million. Um, I just wanted to share this with the board and the public. We will be coming back at a later board meeting um, to ask for further direction on how we would like to um, administer and expend those funds into the community. And so with that, that is our presentation. Um, the two recommendations that we have would be for the board to accept the update on the Stanislaus Emergency Rental Assistance Program and then to authorize the chief executive officer or his designee to negotiate and execute um, agreements with the California Department of Housing and Community Development Department um, related to administering the state of California's rental assistance program round one reservation for Stanislaus County in the approximate amount of 10.7 million. Okay, and with that, um, Happy to answer any questions. Um, Barbara is here and also Jim Cruz, um, Deputy Executive Director with the Stanislaus Regional Housing Authority is here. Could you, we keep talking about being oversubscribed, but obviously we've only uh, approved a fraction of it. Mm -hmm. And we're just basing that off of who we believe are eligible, the applications. And what is that number, do we know? What we think, oh, because we have 10, or. We, there's a total of 10 or 16.4 yeah. million between the county and city of Modesto. Right. I want to say it was well over 20. I'm, yeah. That looks like it's going to be eligible. We just haven't been able to get it through the complete system. Right. Okay. I, I just wanted to make sure. Now, if we do find out that um, with the, I'm not going to call it the discount rate, but with the disapproval rate, um, we would be able to work with the state to get some of those applications back to pay under our funding. We, we asked them the same question. If yeah. we have funding left yeah. over, would you be able to absorb that? We also asked them if they would be able to just absorb this funding now, and the answer is no. They won't do that. So what this does now is it runs the two programs actually simultaneously. Um, we've already diverted uh, applications to the state. They can't process them until there's an MOU with all parties involved but we've diverted it so the programs can run at the same time. But we, we actually had that discussion both ways, the state and, mm -hmm. and federal, that if they were oversubscribed, they could send them back to us. So the idea is for both of us to work at the same time to get to the finish line and whoever has money left to get it to our folks through the other party. Yeah, originally when we started out, I didn't think there was any way we would, because it's really 32 million with the city, right? Uh, through the whole program. 30 with the state reservation, yeah. right? Yeah, I didn't think we were going to get through that money based on the or that the need was there under the guidelines. Mm -hmm. 
and but it looks like under the guidelines we're going to be able to meet that on the first portion mm -hmm. uh, okay okay good to know questions yeah. yeah so i i guess i should question that 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 they um that these people uh, we are going to be able to spend this money and be eligible when i look at the numbers that we have so far um with and it seems like that's more of the problem than We've got the 32 million, whatever it is, 20 million from us, and 12 from the state. Is that right? I thought it was 36, but maybe somewhere, whatever that is. And so, but we've, um, when I look at the amount of, of these applications that are um, incomplete or, or wait listed, do, are we confident that we are going to be able, that these people are eligible for this, or, or are they not going to be eligible? Because it sounds like a lot of people just stop paying their rent just because of COVID and, and there was no, they weren't actually eligible for any of these funds. I guess I'm, that's really fuzzy with all of that right now. Do, does it seem like that we are going to be able to get through all this money if people are eligible for this? I think so. I don't know if that we're going to be able to get through them with our allocation. It might transition over to the state because they can, they can do the federal application. What happens with these kind of programs um, is we do a lot of outreach. So we, we've done a ton of outreach, but unfortunately the state does a more vague outreach. So what people heard was um, even homeowners have applied, um, and, and this isn't even a program where a homeowner is eligible. And so what people heard out the door was, if you're behind, you know, you can go here and they'll pay your rent. Some people heard your mortgage. So we had a glut of applications all at once to process through. What happens is once people like your neighbor or your cousin or your sister starts getting funding, then people under start understanding what the program is. The other issue is kind of what you guys were talking about before, is if people continue to have problems, the extensions, that they can come back for more funding. So I, I believe so. Um, I can't give you a guarantee on that. The other thing that I can't give you a guarantee on is the, you know, the federal um, government gives a certain amount for the state and for the city. I can't guarantee you that those numbers will work out with the percentages they gave us either. But by working with the state, I think we can balance that out. So I think so, but I can't guarantee you because the program's been interesting so far. Okay, so they will. There, there are enough individuals out there that fit into our categories for the area median income and and all of those requirements, and we're gonna, we have people that are eligible for this, and we think hopefully we'll be able to get these fun, funds out there if that's the case, and yeah. it won't just be that people just don't qualify and the money's just gonna sit there. Right, that's, that's, that's the goal. That's why it's on ha all hands on deck, because with that ending um, eviction moratorium September 30th, it's become critical. Mm -hmm. Okay, it just it seems like a tough deadline for us to be able to make, and. Yes, sir. this money to get out there. I just don't see it happening. Um, I, I don't disagree with you. Yeah. And again, that's why we've got the four agencies working on it um, to do it simultaneously. But one of our biggest problems is we need to quit processing applications that are not eligible. Mm -hmm. It just takes up a tremendous amount of time. Not only do we have to process them, we have to report on all of them and do all of the work that we would for another application. So yeah. okay. we're really trying to get efficient Okay. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Opening it up to the public. Come on up. Okay, again, for the record, my name is Steve Morrow. Um, I was not aware that there was a huge problem with people who just basically stopped paying their rent. That never really was reported in any of the media that I read. Red. I know a lot of people have lost jobs, gotten ill, and that's forced them to come behind. And those folks really do need help. But is there any type of an agency or program that we can try to work and identify the quote, the deadbeats that are just not paying their rent so that um, we can assist the landlords maybe to work with some type of an eviction procedure and try to get them to, let's get the deadbeats under control and still continue to work with the people who truly need some help. This may not fall under the guise of the Housing Authority, but I wonder if we have some, some way of identifying that, because that'll help out our poor landlords too, because they're small business people too, and they've suffered just as well. 
I can speak to that. First of all, I, I, I take a little deference to that um, term. I think people are experiencing a pandemic that they've never experienced before. I think they hear things in the media and maybe they prioritize things differently. So maybe they think, okay, if I don't have to pay my rent, then I can pay this or catch up with this. And I, I don't know that everybody's um, a deadbeat or anything okay. like that. I, I apologize for yeah. that. That was a poor choice of terms on my part. Um, I, I do think that we are trying to focus. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, just to let you know some of the outreach that we've done and that we're doing, um, the outreach teams um, have gone out with mobile outreach and they've, they've had over 9,000 contacts with the community. Additionally, we've gone to over 10 um, nonprofit agencies that we're working with for that very reason, with about a third of them being um, focusing on the Latina, Latino uh, Hispanic community. So actually we do that. What my job is to keep people in housing. And so we try to do that. We try to find every other way that we can, but it may or may not be through this program. There are other avenues and, and ways that we can go because we're trying to house people because we know that if we house them, we stabilize them. We're also adding workforce housing because what we're seeing in our community is a lack of housing for people who are entry level workers. And we don't want to discourage that, I think is your real point. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is get a continuum going where somebody can go from homelessness to Kansas House to a rental apartment to workforce housing to home ownership and have a way to hop on the continuum depending on what resources they have. So yeah, we're working really hard at it and that's part of the issue that when this program came down with so much money, like you were saying, we didn't have the resources because we're all working on these other things. So we cobbled this together and now we're just regrouping to make it more efficient. So to your point, I, I don't disagree, I think, with what the spirit of your comment is. There's a lot of us working to keep people in housing because that's what stabilizes our community. Well, I know I spoke earlier today about home ownership and how tough it is for people trying to purchase homes, but I know the rent is just, rental market is just going haywire just as well. And a lot of people are working hard and can really not afford the market rates that are out there. So anything that any of the agencies that can do to help support, help, and keep people in housing is very, very important and very, very appreciated. Thank you. I think that this community has done an exceptional job. Um, everything from the Shaw to focus on prevention for homelessness to um, home ownership programs, down payment assistance. We're working on different kinds of housing and types and the, the city and the county and the housing authority and our nonprofits have spent um, in CSA an inordinate amount of time focusing on the housing because we agree with that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, I didn't, nobody asked me to answer that. <laughs> but you did. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, All right. Again, I did not intend, intend to insult anybody. Nope. And I know the folks at the Housing Authority work hard because it's a real bad problem. I know there was no uh, malice. So thank you. I appreciate okay. it. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else in the public? Since Stephen's the only public member left. Yeah. You're going to get the four gold stars for sticking through <laughs> the longest meeting we've had in a long time. All right. Then I'm going to bring it back to the board. For action. I move to approve staff's recommendation. We have a motion. I'll second that motion. And a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. And Tina, thank you for spending your birthday with us, oh. your 29th birthday, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> presenting. I wouldn't yeah. want to be anywhere else. Uh, uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> exciting all day. Barbara, thank you for coming in. We, we do appreciate all you do, too. Yeah, thank you. At the guys. Housing Authority. Okay, we're going to move on to correspondence. This board has received a letter from the clerk recorder and register of voters inviting a member of the Board of Supervisors to be a participant on the election observer panel for the California gubernatorial recall election on Tuesday, September 14, 2021. And we are going to designate member Chance Condit to that. Thank you for agreeing to serve. This board has received a copy of the fourth quarter financial reports for the Gallo Center for the Arts for the period of April 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2021. Refer to the Chief Executive Office. This board has received a letter from the Federal Emergency Management Agency regarding the flood insurance rate map and letter of map change actions for properties and or structures located in Stanislaus County. 
refer to the Office of Emergency Services and the Department of Planning and Community Development and the Department of Public Works. This board has received a letter of support from the Modesto City Schools regarding the City of Modesto annexing the Tuolumne area located southwest of the Modesto City County Airport. Refer to the Chief Executive Office and Stanislaus Local Agency Formation Commission. This board has received a copy of the Eastside Mosquito Abatement District's fiscal year 2021-2022 budget. Refer to the Auditor Controller's Office. This board has received the claims as noted on the agenda. Acknowledge receipt of claims and refer to the Chief Executive Office. Are there any Board of Supervisor reports? Just doing the election observation tonight. Uh, for the special election for the City Series. Yep. Oh, thank you very much for doing that. And that's why um, Supervisor Condit, Chance Condit, is going to do the next one election cycles. And then when you're chairman, you don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta love it. I'm just kidding. Uh, item 11, le Legislative Fiscal Management Report. Patrice. Just real quick to let the public know that next week the county will host begin hosting a series of community workshops and public hearings to inform our redistricting efforts. Um, this follows um, each decade after the census and the uh, redistricting process. It's our goal to guide that with transparency and public input. So. Uh, the first meeting is the 7th, starting in Oakdale. And for more information or the entire schedule of meetings, um, please visit our website, stancounty.com, uh, redistricting. Perfect. Uh, we do have a closed session. Yes, we have several items for closed session this afternoon. The first is a conference with labor negotiator uh, pursuant to government code section 54957.6 the agency negotiators and the uh, uh, unions are noted in the agenda. Uh, conference, the second item is a conference of legal uh, counsel regarding existing litigation pursuant to government code section 549-56.9 subdivision D1. There are three cases, uh, protect our water and environmental resources at all versus County of Stanislaus at all. Stanislaus County Superior Court case number 2006-153 and Jamie Coston et al. versus County of Stanislaus et al. And that is Superior Court case number 216561. Uh, and the third and last item is Renee Frazier versus County of Stanislaus et al. And that's Superior Court case number CV 20002318. And would that be appropriate for public comment? Any public comment on closed session? All right, before I hit the gavel, Deputy Gingrich, thank you again for keeping us safe, and we're adjourned to closed session.